Hey, everybody, we are experiencing some technical difficulties here at This Week in Science. Justin is uh, having some kind of browser issue with our streaming platform. And lo and behold, out of the blue, it doesn't like him anymore. So um, I see him. I see him there, and he is chatting with us in our little chat area, but I don't know where it, he did. No video, no audio. He's, he is somewhere in the interwebs. We are live. Yes. I apologize for the fact that we have no Justin yet. I would love to get a Justin. Um, yeah, I don't know how to tell Justin how to make the internet work for him. I asked him if his internet was plugged in. Mm. One grouchy gamer says, Justin, reboot your POS. Oh. I know what that means. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Uh. Too yeah, maybe a computer reboot needs to happen before the computer will do the thing. Yes. So I love uh, Fada. Thank you. Reminding everyone to smash the like and the subscribe buttons. Um, the bell thingy too. If you want to get notifications for when we go live and are missing our third host, ding, 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 ding. Like right now you would be getting that notification off the hizzy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Justin's still there. He's not commenting now. I don't know what he's doing because there's, oop, there's a message. Maybe this message is, <gasps> what? He can use everything everywhere, but try a different browser. Try a different browser. I will tell him. Good. Uh, he said in the private chat, he is working on a workaround. A worker. Okay. <laughs> We're working around. We're working around. And this is how we get around. A do, 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 Ah. So there was a lot of science this week. Mm -hmm. Hey, Blair, mm -hmm. you know, while Justin's waiting, I mean, not waiting, mm -hmm. but working on his workaround, um, yeah. How I mean, do you want to tell me about some some mink? Oh yeah, we can do that while we're while we're yeah. Do you want to tell me about out? a it's a little pre-show story sure, to sure. wet your science whistles? Yeah. Um I it's a bummer too, Justin would really like this one. But um <laughs> this is about carnivore microbiomes. So a study found a dramatic difference between the microbial diversity in guts of female and male American minks. This is an unexpected sexual distinction in gut microbiomes of carnivores, which has ramifications for future research. So um, carnivores, they're pretty hard to track. They're very elusive. And so a lot of wildlife research is done by uh, examining poop. They examine <laughs> yeah. the poop to figure out what they've been up to, if they're sick, how old they are, what they've been eating. And so the guts of um, the carnivores can often tell the story of what they're up to in terms of ecology. Um, part of the reason for that also is that their guts are very short and simple. Um, herbivore guts are super long because you have to process things like grass. It takes forever to break down, but carnivore right. guts are really short, which is the zookeeper in me telling you, this is one of the reasons you, uh, if you're a carnivore <laughs> keeper, um, Carnivore poop's very stinky. It is some of the stinkiest poop. Herbivore poop, some of the least stinky poop. And this is partially what I believe to be why. It's because the herbivore poop has been ultra, ultra processed. So much has been taken out, out of it. And it's just grass, right? But yeah, um, carnivore grass poop and bacteria. Is meat, first of all, which is going to be like, it's going to be stinkier just because of what it is. It rots differently, but also because it's a shorter gut. So anyway... Um, the fact that they have a shorter gut also means there's less time for the immune system, which is different from males and females to influence microbial diversity, but they still see differences because there are in other cases, differences between male and female poop and microbiomes. Um, but that's usually associated with a longer gut because there's less opportunity for that to kind of get 
mucked up in the process. Yeah. And so uh, this has a huge implication because in the past they would just collect poop and analyze it for whatever they wanted. But now it looks like they're going to have to do DNA extraction to figure out if the sample is male or female before they can do research on the actual poop. So that's kind of the larger implication here um, is to see they, they're going to have to figure out what the sex of the quote unquote donor poop is before they sequence it. Why? Why are, I mean, why male and female differences? We why? don't know. Is this just hormone related? Is, I mean, I don't know anything about mink reproduction. What's their estrus cycle? They're yeah. a mammal, but what, yeah. like, what are they closely related to? Weasels. So <laughs> badgers, yeah, badgers, wolverines, okay. martens, ferrets, otters. Okay. So it's, yeah. So basically this just kind of raises more questions. They also found out, which is really cool that, um, they, there is no difference in the quality and the sample taken from the poop, uh, based on time or temperature, which is really helpful to know. That's actually how a lot of this research started. It's helpful to know because a lot of the time you come across a sample, you don't know if it's been five days or five hours or five minutes since that right. animal. Well, you'd know if it's five minutes because it'd be warm. But Nice and warm. Anyway. Nice little warm <laughs> carnivore poo. Yeah. yeah. But so that's that's really good news. The kind of the bummer news is that they have to add this extra level to fecal research now. Hmm. That's fascinating. I want to know more. What makes the difference? Why is it different? Oh, I mean, I'm not, I'm actually not surprised it's different, but I am surprised it's different. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. I have another story tonight that's about an unsurprising difference between males and females. I mean, it just goes, it goes, it kind of, I mean, it's mink, but at the same time, it goes in line with like so many assumptions that we've made over the years that yeah. like, oh, males and females are yeah, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's the same. Or just, you know, we'll only study male animals because that that works for everybody because we need the female animals to make more test subjects so we'll yeah. just yeah but also that but also just modern medicine a lot of um human medicine the research was done on males yeah. <laughs> the, exactly that's um yeah. yeah we need our good samples good morning justin Hi. good morning oh, hey boy. yo you get that work around working yeah, so the only thing that has changed in my setup is at some point today, my mouse stopped working. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's going on? And so I did a reset. Turned out, Microsoft update. Right, okay. So somehow, uh, it has convinced uh, the live stream site that I am blocking it from camera and mic on yeah. my computer. Even though... Uh, you said, a little camera hello. in the browser thingy, not a problem. Anywhere else, not a problem. I can use my camera everywhere. I can access it anywhere else. On this side, I can. But uh, thankfully, there's another computer in the house. So uh, as long as its battery Woo! lasts, I will be here for the show. <laughs> well, let's have a tight 90 and hope Justin, that the battery <laughs> lasts the whole time. Can you tap on your mic? I kind of oh, think yeah, good question. My... Yeah, it may not be the the right one. Hang on. Boom, boom, boom. Wait, have you tapped on your mic? Uh okay. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Great. Good. I had a, I had a weird is it feeling. is it quiet? Am I quiet? Is that what's happening? <laughs> it it felt uh, it felt like kind of tinnier than normal, which is why I thought it was maybe a laptop mic, but uh, <sighs> we're good. Woohoo! We have a show. We have all the hosts. It is very Fire. exciting. I have a pink right. beverage. I'm ready to go. Now we can begin. You have, she's going to finish that drink way too soon. We've already talked about poop. So we already this have. is great. You can oh. splice that into the show later if you want or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm gonna say oh. my technical issues obviously prevented me from entering hair and makeup this morning. I don't 
<laughs> we don't need you in hair and makeup. It's all good. All right, everybody. Are we ready for this? I'm ready for this. Let's start the show. Let's do the real, real dealy bobber doodly ding whatever. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's do that thing that she was talking let's about. Wee! All right, everybody, starting the show in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 858, recorded on Wednesday, January 12th, 2022. How to transplant a pig heart. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with dolphins, sharks, and ponies. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. You, without meaning to offend anyone else who might be listening, you are a current modern human. But what is a current modern human? Mostly hairless ape descendant made up of a collection of odd ape descendants who over time added their genetic makeup to form that which you consider to be you. And what are you? Most philosophers would agree that you are a construct of consciousness, a self-aware, squishy brain creature living in a shell of bone, and reliant on a system of anatomical parts, all working together to supply you with a steady diet of human blood upon which to feed. Everything you know of the world beyond is through intermediaries, senses that report back information that is stored, correlated, interconnected, and analyzed within the neural network that is you. And when something goes wrong, when a part malfunctions, when a limb, nerve, or organ begin to fail, it can jeopardize the comfort, quality, safety, and security of squishy brain creature life. And so, you do the thing that squishy brain creatures are so adept at. You seek solutions. How best to keep the blood flowing, the senses reporting, the anatomical parts operating at optimal levels. At times, the solutions are simple. A new pair of glasses, a brace for the knee, medication for an ailment, a vaccine even, to preempt a problem from happening in the first place. And in an extreme situation, you may even need to replace your heart. If you do, that new heart, that new part, that new blood pump, regardless of where it originated, becomes yours. Because you are more than a collection of parts. You are the very model of a modern squishy brain creature living in a shell of bone feasting on human blood. And your best tool for surviving the world is This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to feel Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are here through the magic of modern technology. All of us collections of squishy brain folk. We are the model of a modern squishy brain. I really <laughs> got to figure out how to make that work. One of my favorite musicals. Anyhow, thank you all for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. And I am so excited to talk about all the science that we brought to the show tonight. So much of it out there in the world. I brought stories about spots on the moon, dark spots on the moon, zoo air, and fingerprints. Uh -huh. See at those fingerprints. What do you have, Justin? Oh, wait, that's a great question. I have no idea what I brought. <laughs> Stories. Uh, yeah, but I'm on the wrong. I'm on the wrong page. On uh, the rundown. <laughs> good, good. So, uh, those are the wrong. I was like, those look good. Like good stories. Well, Justin, if I were you, I would guess that you had something about the first ever 
uh human versus a volcano <laughs> first uh, first human ever versus a volcano uh my little medieval war ponies how hemp can prevent covid better government through drug fueled drinking and a new segment that i call my problem with that <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait for that one. Maybe that's one we can all pick up as we yeah. move forward <laughs> this year. My problem with that. Oh, I like it. Okay, Blair, what is in the animal yes. corner? Yes, I have dolphin anatomy, dogs wearing headphones, and uh, spiders wearing hats or pants, depending on where they'd wear them. We'll talk about it. <laughs> okay. Costuming for spiders. I like it. Well, we all like our little bit of costuming and i also like our little bit of science here and all of you if you have not yet subscribed make sure that you look for us on all the podcast players this week in science or twists we are also on instagram and twitch and twitter as twist science we live stream from twitch facebook and youtube you can find us and our website is twist.org that's where you can find all the details that you might want to look for. But now it is time for the science. So let's dive into all these stories that we have teased in the last few moments. All right. We're just going to go right in to pig hearts. We're jumping in. We have talked about animal transplants. We've talked about pig hearts. We've talked about all this stuff before on the show. They did it finally. Yeah. Pig to human transplant. One of my favorite headlines, though, was from The Onion, where they said, pig dies while waiting, or no, anyway, there was, waiting there was for a funny, human body? <laughs> there was like a very <laughs> funny headline from The Onion, which I highly recommend. But anyway, pig heart transplant. What did they do? How did they do it? Why did they do it finally? Uh, so turns out the gentleman who has received this this xeno transplantation uh is named david bennett he's 57 years old and he had advanced heart failure and was not eligible for a heart transplant because he hadn't done things to take care of uh or taken steps to take care of his body and his heart Knowing that, the researchers uh, petitioned the U.S. FDA to authorize the pig heart transplant. Now, the heart came from a company that's called Revivacore, and Revivacore has been working in this area for years. They have been implanting pig hearts into baboons. They have been looking at all sorts of xenotransplantation possibilities, and for this particular pig heart, it has had multiple gene modifications. So they um, knocked out three genes that are enzymes that, that, that allow pigs to synthesize sugars that our bodies recognize as foreign. And so that gene modification basically gets rid of those sugars so that our body can't latch on to those markers and go, hey, we don't want you. Reject, reject, reject. Um, mm -hmm. Additionally, there were human genes anti added, anti-inflammatory genes, uh, genes for blood co coagulation and prevention of blood vessel damage, and regulatory proteins related to immune and antibody response. And then finally, they removed growth hormone because they don't want the pig heart to continue growing inside <laughs> of anybody's chest because that can cause heart failure and yeah. other problems. <laughs> so let's, let's just stop it from one. growing. Yeah, it's already a big heart in there. Let's just, just calm yourself down. So the researchers uh, back in September, we talked about this, the, the possibility of having these modifications and how they could work in baboons. But uh, now, yes, they have successfully transplanted this heart into this male human, 57-year-old male human. The interesting aspect of these hearts, too, that this heart had to be kept alive and kept and, and, and kept happy in a bath of 
a, a bath of uh, of of nutrients, and it had to be prepared and ready to be put into the human body. So uh, it was. Uh, they were uh, they stored it in a cocktail that was commercialized by a company out of Sweden called Ex Vivo. And basically it gets bathed in a nutrient broth that has water, hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, and then the fun one, cocaine. Good for the pig heart. Good, good for the pig heart. I guess. Apparently it keeps the pig heart fresh. Okay. Um, so this is—is is that true? Uh, after it goes in, also no. After it goes, <laughs> I mean, I'm like suddenly you had you get a pig heart, and suddenly you have a need. Yeah. <laughs> that you suddenly it's have the 1980s previously. again. Yeah, and I feel like I'm in living 40 years in the past. Yeah, um, but so, this is a so now the this gentleman has to be also on a and. Uh, a rejection immunosuppressant. Uh, it's called KPL 404, and it'll shut down antibody production that uh, basically these antibodies usually lead B cells to talk to T cells to get the immune response going. And this guy is going to be on this immunosuppressant regime for uh, as long as he has this heart. Um, mm -hmm. and they've, they're also working on this immunosuppressant KPL 404 as a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, lots of interesting aspects here for, uh, suppressing the immune system. But in this particular case, it's so that the body will want to keep the heart working and in the body, not rejected. So, so this the, the yeah, thing yeah. I find most intriguing is, uh... Is at some point, like the our very early part of your telling of the story is, you know, congratulations, Mr. Bennett. Uh, you, you, yeah, we've we've figured out your heart problem that uh, can be solved by giving you a, a donor heart. Oh, hey, that's great news. Yeah, oh, this is gonna work out fine. Yeah, the only thing is, you have to, and I don't know the details for sure. I'm just I'm speculating. You have to quit smoking. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, then, but then, yeah. You'll, then you'll live a long time. Okay, okay. So, so what else you got? Oh, that's kind of it. No, no, no. Yeah, come on, come on. There's got to be something huh. else. Well, there is this like thing where they're looking to put a pig heart in a human being for the first time, and it's never been tried before, and we don't know if it'll work. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Do that one. I want that one. <laughs> we have to take care of himself for the the head. Like that's the only thing I could think of. And I... It's. I mean, the conversation must have been an interesting one. I mean, this is going to give this gentleman an unknown amount of time. His heart was, he was in basically in heart failure. His heart was going to die. It, it was, it was game over for this guy. So it was the choice between game over or go through this procedure and Maybe he'll, who knows how long he'll last. The baboons that have received these pig hearts um, have lasted a maximum of nine months, but that wasn't because of heart failure. It was actually because of a lung infection because mm. uh, there has to be the immunosuppressant. And so infections are a bigger problem for animals, people who have uh, these kinds of xenotransplanted organs. Um, so, so who knows? Nine months? Six months? Three years? I have nobody has any idea how long this will last. Yeah. This is the first one of its kind. They'd like to do another, and they're going to petition the FDA to do again, uh, do this procedure again. And they are also hoping to get a clinical trial started at some point soon so that they can know um, whether or not all these genetic modifications are necessary so that they can know how long somebody might actually have so that they can get a real idea of yeah how these things work yeah we'll see in nine months or whatever yeah between this and 3d printing technology if we could combine those two things so that nobody has to wait for organs so it would be really yeah nice. we could 3d print the pig and then uh, yeah. <laughs> see, but but that's kind of what i was thinking too is like I, I know in an ideal world where you can kind of go sci-fi with it and just imagine that 3D printed organs are perfect, that would be the preferred choice. But in the reality of where the science is actually at, the pig mm -hmm. heart is the way to go right now. 
Yeah, and and all yeah. all of the <laughs> joking aside, uh, Patrick P. Wonder if he can find truffles now in the chat room. Yeah, yeah. All that joking aside, nine months does not sound like a lot of time to those of us who think well, time is basically unlimited at the moment. Yeah. Right. If, if when when you are when you're up against uh, the clock ticking down the seconds, you're counting the rest of your life in seconds and minutes. Nine months. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot done. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gift. It's extra. It's, yeah. So good luck to uh, to this gentleman. And um, we wish him well. And we hope he is the first of many. And that many lives can be extended with this mm -hmm. technology moving forward. Justin, you got a story? Oh, gosh, I suppose I do. Uh, oh, so, gosh, golly. Let's see. Uh, first human ever. Uh, just got a little bit older. We're talking about Omo One, whose remains are found in Ethiopia by uh, Leakey in the 60s. He is the oldest known Homo sapien that we have found. Uh, that is the atomically modern human. Oldest one we ever found. Until now, we didn't really know how old it was. Scientists have been attempting to, to accurately date this fossil since they found it. And it is thought that it was thought to be around 195,000 years old. So they use, uh, been using chemical fingerprints of volcanic ash layers to try to determine uh, the time it was. Some of that sediment, though, was kind of hard uh, for them to work with initially. Uh, technology being of what it was at the time. An international team of scientists led by University of Cambridge has readdressed the age of OMO-1 remains. And now it looks like it is the oldest, again, example, pushing back the age of our species as well. So the new research is saying that this, uh, this thing's about 230,000 at least 230,000 years old. So it knocked it back 35,000 years at, at the minimum. So it could be, it's definitely older than that. Uh, they, there's nothing new that they found about the bones themselves. It's the volcanic ash the bones were found in, or that, were, uh, that it was found below, have been more accurately dated. And that volcanic activity that laid down the oh. ash that's on the layer above uh, mm -hmm. Oma 1, are dated to 230,000 years. So, so that whole relative people. dating in the fossil record thing. Yeah, so the yeah. bones are older. You don't have the, the maximum age on the on the bones yet, but it's it's older than that. But that pushes back humans, modern uh, current modern humans uh, another uh, 35,000 years. Which is significant. That's yeah. quite a that's I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking millions of years, but still 35,000 years is a significant chunk of time. I mean, and, uh, I'm saying that as somebody who has not yet achieved 50. So <laughs> <laughs> staring down the barrel of it, but still. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, I guess part of the confusion is they had, a, they had assigned it. It's a very volcanic area. This is Ethiopia. This is Rift Valley. Uh, there was a lot of volcanic activity back in the day and they had assigned that that layer of ash to the wrong volcano and wrong, wrong volcanic activity turns out hmm. the chemical fingerprint is a match for a volcano that's more than 400 kilometers away uh so it was it was not the not the closest one <laughs> not the most obvious choice i suppose uh, for it. So, but when you're talking about ash from a volcano that gets carried through the air problem. laid down so it's not necessarily obvious all it, it that's not going to be as obvious yeah. yeah 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 so that's that's a major uh major update uh on human origin history even older than we thought and again we keep getting rift, older rift valley has like it has, because of the volcanic activity because of the way that valley is laid out and been moving apart it's not just that that's where human <clears throat> activity was most in the world necessarily at that time but it is like the ideal place to look for fossils so it, it you know 
it's sort of we 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 keep looking at it like it's the oldest, but it's the oldest we've found because we mm -hmm. found it in the easiest place to find such things. So there could be somewhere else uh, hiding even older uh, versions of the current modern human. Uh, but again, even then, what is a current modern human with this whole braided stream thing? Yeah, they yeah, will yeah, continue yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the oldest uh, like us that we have uh, found. Very cool. I love it. Yeah, I, I, it's going to be the explorers, the adventurers who go into caves and are digging places that we haven't dug before that are hard to reach that suddenly are going to make the extraordinary finds because they're they definitely places. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's places that were habitable and easy to reach or, you know, nice to live in at one point in time, but mm -hmm. maybe not so much right now. Right. You have to think about what things were like in certain places at certain times to, yeah. to figure out where the people were. Yeah. That's cool. Very, very cool. Blair, you yes. want to bring us in? Yes. So I have a, a very interesting study from um, Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And uh, this breakthrough study has found that just like humans, female dolphins have a functional clitoris. So they, this is something apparently that's up for debate through most of the animal kingdom. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the human clitoris wasn't fully described by science until the 1990s. So I'm no just sad wonder. on, I'm, I'm, I'm sad and disappointed by <laughs> science and the world right now. <sighs> okay. Yeah, well, we were having a Continue. conversation in the pre-show about uh, women representation in, in scientific studies because of a, a piece of research that came out this week about uh, from linguists looking at gender representation in, in language texts. And anyway, point being, uh, female females of species are often underrepresented in scientific studies in general especially in humans, especially in medical research in humans, the women are often left off. And so this isn't that surprising, especially based on, you know, cues in, in, in our culture about sex and female pleasure in sex and all these, it's not surprising, right? But so that has spread to our understanding of the animal kingdom. And so now it actually takes a research paper to show that a species has a clitoris. So I just kind of wanted to explain how this happened. Um, so first of all, it makes perfect sense for dolphins to have them because they have sex as part of maintaining social bonds. They've also seen females rubbing each other in that area with their snouts, flippers, flukes. So there is, again, lots of kind of um, anecdotal reasons for this to make sense. Um, and just kind of social understanding, social dynamics of dolphins, but they actually had to look at clitorises from, um, deceased dolphins to find out, to kind of find the structural proof that there was feeling in these spaces and that, and that it was a functional thing. So they looked at the present shape and configuration of erectile bodies. They looked at nerve fibers and just like the human clitoris, the dolphin clitoris has a large area of erectile tissue that fills up with blood and has free nerve endings underneath thinner skin than on other parts of their genitalia. So it's there. They can feel female pleasure is part of sex in dolphins. And researchers also note that there's been little study of the cl clitoris and female sexual pleasure in nature as a whole. So what I was talking about before, this is a good reminder to maybe look at that again. You know, just thinking about hyenas off of the top of my head, the, the alpha female hyenas will actually have enlarged mm -hmm. clitoris that resemble a penis. So they're not that different of structures. So it's just, it would be odd for it to not do this that it's whatever anyway point being they've done some research hopefully this will help push more research into the female side of sex in the animal kingdom and it can kind of bring that into the holistic conversation so it's not just wholly focused on the other side but 
Um, and yeah. it, it seems so. Uh, this. How many times have we had conversations about uh, studies that have finally happened? looking at animals and the you know, different species in the animal kingdom. And we're like, that seems so obvious. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, uh, if you talk about dolphins, there's always the conversation about how kind of wild and crazy they are. And they yes. talk about though, usually the teenage male dolphins being hyper aroused mm -hmm. and acting. Girls, women are left out of the conversation across totally. the board. A couple yeah. of things on this. One, I, I feel like I heard this story already. Like, I feel like this, there's something like this yeah. happened. Already. Did we report on a preliminary look at this or something? I don't know. It sounds It does not familiar. ring a bell to me. It really does to me. It feels like it was a, a even a couple of years ago, uh, mm. there was mm -hmm. some, some talk about this. But uh, I, I've also seen this when we're talking about the linguist. You see it, and we're talking about how, how, Medical uh, research is very male centric. Mm -hmm. The difference between what is disseminated about childbirth through the medical field and what you can get from midwives, again, <laughs> but this, the the wealth of knowledge about how birthing works and all the little intricacies that go in to uh, preparing for and giving birth versus the medical profession, which is just come in and push. That's what you do. That's and if you need drugs, we'll give you drugs. That's kind of almost. Yeah. And then at some point, we're just going to give up on the natural process and give you a C-section at ever increasing rates, versus people who've really studied and understand the process. It's it's yeah, it's dramatic everywhere. So these things need to get these bridges need to get uh, spanned. Mm -hmm. Over the gulfs of knowledge there. Well, understanding more about other mammals, about other relatives of ours other species and how how things work generally is going to help us understand more about ourselves as well and i mean understanding more about how the animal kingdom works and why different species mm -hmm. work the way they do yeah i'm also surprised this isn't in the animal corner now i'm really intrigued to find out what is going to be in the animal what is going to be in the animal like, corner what? bled into the the short stories today there was just too much <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how did how did dolphin glitters not become part of that? And there's, uh, all right, yeah, no, I can't, can't wait to yeah, find out. Okay, well, now we're gonna move on from uh, the functional clitoris in the dolphin to big giant crater on the moon. Ooh. It's a completely logical leap, isn't it? Yes. Uh, well, let's talk about a big old crater on the south pole of the moon. That is, uh, that's called the Aitken Crater. The Aitken Crater, we can't see it from where we are. The face of the moon as we see it, if you look down at the south, the bottom end of the moon, we can see the, the edges of the crater, but we can't actually see it. The only reason we really know about it is we finally have sent craft up and we've been orbiting and looking at the whole moon. And so we know that this crater is a very large and special feature on the moon. So researchers have been trying to figure out, okay, a big impact like that, what would it have done to the moon? When did it happen? How did it happen? And um, we, the fact that it's a giant crater on the moon suggests that it occurred after the molten period of the moon. So there was a, a period of time where the moon was really, really hot after the big impact that shot the moon out from the earth and other stuff started glomming in and it turned into the moon. That was its own thing. And there was a magma ocean on the, in, the moon was just a hot magma body in, in space. And then it started cooling down, getting a crust. That crust was then bombarded and the Aitken Crater came to be. But we also have evidence of volcanic activity, these volcanic mares that are up on the northern part of the moon, mm -hmm. almost exactly opposite the Aitken Crater. And so there's been this kind of thought of like, how, oh, are these things related? And so some researchers did simulations. We still have to go look at rocks on the moon, which a Chinese rover might be well-placed to be able to do. Um, but we have to... They, they took a look at uh, the simulation and simulated impacts on the moon. They simulated the ways that 
different sizes and angles of big impacts would have affected the moon. And they realized that there's one particular angle that a giant asteroid would be bombarding at. And through that, it would hit the crust of the moon, break into it, create a crater. You know, it would get blasted to smithereens. But it, yes, and it would go, yes, Blair, into the moon. And it, the asteroid oh would just burrow itself right in there. Um, but that would also set off magma movement, material movement through the moon that would lead to the creation of these little volcanoes exactly opposite the impact crater. That's crazy, and I love it. (laughs) (laughs) So something just punched right into the moon, and the moon went, ouch! And, and And didn't hit it bad enough to toss it out of orbit. Exactly. It wasn't such a big impact, a big... Uh, asteroid or uh-huh. meteor, yeah, asteroid. Do we know it, where, where maybe the moon used to be somewhere else? <laughs> yeah, maybe it had a different orbit. I got, yeah, it was much know. closer, it had been moved, or yeah. far, I guess farther. It was like farther, and it got moved closer. in a little bit closer, right? <sighs> right, who knows? I mean, it probably was budged a little bit. This is, I mean, talk mm-hmm. about a nudge. Yeah. <sighs> it didn't blow up the moon, but it just added some mass. And so now there might be a big mass, more mass. It just goes to show that the inside of the moon is not just a homogenous, mm-hmm. nice moon inside, that there's a lot of stuff in different places. So it's all mixed up and there's been a churn. And it's lopsided. <sighs> and it's the moon is very likely lopsided. Yes. <laughs> yes. But now, thanks to rovers and spacecraft we have a chance to uh, investigate this further but like i said the next step really will to be will be to look at rocks on the northern side of the moon to see what their signatures are like to see if anything made it all the way through because yeah. that would be kind of cool yeah. All right. All right. That's the moon. So, so tell me well, about your little, I was your gonna, little I was war with, pony. I, yeah. I could do that. I was going to stick with the moon theme because I got oh, a moon You story are? Too. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. go with the moon. Uh, Bring I'm it. Stick, stick with the moon. Uh, going from moon churn to moon chum. And here's my problem with that. A new segment of the show I created just for the following story. Uh, but we'll possibly be using more often in the future as I am getting older and crankier. And I feel like I start more and more sentences with my problem with that. <clears throat> New research from LSU and the University of Florida suggests that more shark attacks occur on average during fuller moon phases. The results of the study have been published in Correlative Statistical Anomaly Digest a magazine that allows researchers to publish papers on correlations they have found between uh, no more than two sets of data that have no known causational relationship. Actually, it was uh, published in Frontiers of Marine Science. And and the authors do point out that they lack a causational link and don't know what the results actually illuminate or if they're even significant, but seem convinced that there is a link there. Okay. Uh, that said, they do have an abundance of data. Global shark attack record collected uh, over a 55-year period, 1960 to 2015, from the International Shark Attack File, which is housed in the Florida Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida. So shark attacks anywhere, everywhere in the world over a 55-year span, and they found something they think is worth publishing and looking into further. Which is fine. That's what researchers are expected to do. You know, find a correlation, I guess, of something and look into it further. I so, have to say, I just am really <clears throat> enjoying watching Blair's face for all the podcast listeners right now. Just, I mean, you might have heard the sigh that came out of her. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm watching her face. And <laughs> yeah, apparently, uh, Blair has a problem with this, too. Yeah, keep going. I have so Justin. many. I have, I'm formulating a list, but you yeah. continue. Okay, okay. We'll get there. We'll get. We'll absolutely get there. So, 
The researchers found that more shark attacks than average occur during periods of higher lunar illumination and fewer attacks than average occur during periods of lower illumination. So over 50, lower, under 50, basically. My problem with that, using illumination. Most shark attacks happen during daylight. Anywho, so how bright the moon is makes very little difference to a shark underwater in the daytime, which the researchers do clearly state. Uh, they say, yes, uh, that, that doesn't really make sense. Yet then they still suggest that there are, in fact, they are, in fact, seeing shark responses to lunar illumination because they did see a trend. The average tax in the data do tend to trend toward higher illumination. And this is globally, beaches around the world, consistently over a long, long time. However, the two highest rates of shark attacks by far happened at the full moon, yes, and at the new moon. That's when there's no illumination whatsoever. Those were the two that had right. the highest. And the rest of it, yeah, it did trend towards, you know, more illumination, more shark attacks. But the two highest were the full moon right. and the new moon. Kind of ruins it. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, when you play Dark Side of the Moon while watching Wizard of the Oz. You know, it, it works. Sounds, it, it, it works. Sometimes, sort of. <laughs> it does it most right. of the time. <laughs> but, it, you, you know, even if you're on the, the right mm. precursor to uh, experiencing that sort of an event, by no means are you supposed to record this and then publish it to anybody of you doing the album with the movie. Okay, so my problem with that, why focus on the sharks at this point? Mm -hmm. Why not the humans? What, is, what, about humans, right? what yeah. is it about humans that sends us running into the ocean uh -huh. at full and new moons? Uh huh. Is missing from the data sets, no matter how many years, no matter how many attacks, this big data record that they, they got to do something with. The ratio of humans to sharks in the water isn't recorded mm -hmm. <clears throat> at all. Uh, yeah, neither are You also know that full moons make people act wonky. <laughs> make right. the people and act so wonky. And it's it's interesting. There's also this week there was a meta analysis published of a bunch of studies, and the researchers suggested that it's not illumination, but it's gravitation. So it's the gravitation that affects the tides and that gravitational field, even though we can't consciously sense it, uh, impacts the way that animals and plants sleep, move, grow, do things. Okay. So you get Here's rid my of problem the with illumination. That. But, Here's my problem yeah. with that. I I'm just I'm just reporting no, no, what I, I have I know, read. I know. But here's my problem <laughs> with that. The the new moon and the full moon uh, is the most dramatic tidal changes that take place due to exactly. gravitational forces. That's true. Yes, but that's not necessarily going to affect a shark either. We're still making that leap of blaming the sharks. That is, however. The two times any newbie surfer worth his wax knows it's time to catch the bomb swell. Right. It's the full moon and the new moon. That's when you got. So it's not really it's not great waves. It's not sure. sharks getting aggro. It's more humans in the ocean. Can I put it's, something else too out? As, um, Kiki, put that graph back up, please. If oh, you can, yes. if it's not gone. Nope, I can um, do that. So this is what I was thinking and why I was sighing so heavily. Shark attack numbers are not in the hundreds or thousands. Yeah. So you can say like, oh my God, there was a 20% increase. Yeah. They're, mm. The standard deviation on some of these is one or two. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, there was one more shark attack on the new moon. That's tough for me. That's tough to say, okay, this was the highest level at... Uh, there were two attacks in Australia at the new moon. Yeah. Well, so so what this is, what this is, uh, though, these aren't. Uh, I think what the the data plot you've got up there now is deviation from averages. I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another and one that low. shows. There's another one that shows more the uh, the numbers. This one. Still. This one. 
In the Under a hundred. In the beginning is the forget the number. The <laughs> beginning part of this chart is the new moon. The last part of this graph is the full moon, and you can see that's where the peaks are. Yeah, and that's also when the most surfers are out. That's also when all of the uh, the coastal tidal uh, fisher people, the people who are casting into the waters, that's when they like to go fishing too, because that uh, rapid wa moving water and that deeper water tends to bring in more fish, which also might be a reason why there might be extra sharks mm -hmm. there, but it doesn't matter because even if the number of sharks is always the same, there's definitely more humans in the water. And when there's more humans, in the contact with the area and where sharks coming are into causing contact confusion. with sharks yeah mm -hmm. there you go yeah so anyway yeah uh what was what was it what's the the thing called oh yeah anyway that's my problem with that yeah <laughs> very good <laughs> approved we approve this message <laughs> awesome that was a lot of fun um yeah so if you don't want to have a higher probability of a shark attack, don't go in the water during the new moon or the full moon. No, 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 no. That's the problem. It doesn't matter. No, I'm kidding. Just stay out of the water completely. Just, that's how, that's okay. the only. That's problem. also I'm not the wrong thing that to either. say. <laughs> but there's also there's also uh, there's also like this is scientific methody wise. There is like okay, you have to start with some uh, start with some kind of knowledge, and there is some sort of knowledge about fish feeding or mating behaviors under moonlight or, you know, there is some, some stuff for them to grab onto. But part of the problem is when you get to asking the question and you've already got your data set and you basically have to ask a question off the data that you already have available, you kind of limit actually having a very informed question that you can ask because you're not doing the experiment. It's like the experiment's already been done. What can we make out of it? Right. Here's the data. What can we infer from this? And that's that's a tougher one. It's post -hoc. scientific method. Yeah. Wise. Exactly. I mean, this is one of the big debate, big arguments about uh, genome wide association studies and about like using machine learning to pull uh, pull results out of big data sets. It's like it's yeah. okay. The relationships are there already. How do you know you're getting the right one? And literally, so. if you just took the phases of the moon and any other data report, you know, car accidents, children being born, uh, uh, crimes being committed, you will find that one phase of the moon or another has an average different than the others yeah. because that's how numbers work. Yeah. Yep. That's just how numbers work. Not everything happens equally evenly all the time. It just doesn't. So if you took 55 years of new moons and full moons and everything else, you're going to see, see a statistical average difference in those phases that has nothing to do with the moon. I like it. Quick story before we move into our COVID update. Uh, the zoo. Blair, mm -hmm. this one is for you. If you step into the zoo and oh. you take... A big inhale oh. through the nose, smell. How many animals do you think you could identify just from one? <laughs> There's usually one that hits you right across the face and you walk in. Well, researchers publishing in Current Biology this week have uh, published their work, two different groups. And it, it's really great because they were all they were both both these groups were working on air DNA, the use of identifying DNA in the air to identify species of animals separately. But then they heard about each other's work. And so then they decided to publish their work at the same time in the same journal. So it's like more replications, more, more better science. And so mm -hmm. this is how this is when science really starts to work. They uh, put their setups, their DNA sniffers in zoos because they figured you know logically if you went to a farm you could sniff cow dna but how do you know if that cow dna is like from that farm or from some farm somewhere nearby that just got blown there on the wind if you're sniffing tiger dna you're probably only getting it from the zoo so Hopefully. to limit their area and the identification this the zoos gave them this awesome environment from which 
to sample DNA, and they were able to identify the animals in the zoo. Uh, so they basically used like a, a computer cooling fan with an air filter attached to it and then let it run. And that air filter then basically collected all the DNA and then they were able to wash it and do all the DNA sampling from there. Um, and the different studies, they were able to identify uh, 20, over 25 species of mammals and birds, DNA belonging to an Eurasian hedgehog, which is endangered in the UK. This was a study at Queen Mary University of London. Um, a team in Copenhagen detected 49 non-human vertebrate species, mammal, bird, reptile, amphibian, and fish. These were animals like the okapi, armadillo, even the guppy in a pond in the tropical house. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so great. And they got squirrels and rats and house mice and other fish species that were used as animal feed in the air mm. also. Um, and they checked to make, they really double checked and checked and over checked to make sure contamination wasn't an issue. But they were uh, pretty confident that they were sampling species who live at the zoos through the air. And so why is this why is this a cool idea? Well, you don't always have zoos. You don't always know what animals are in different places. So for cave ecosystems or jungles or think about just about anywhere, even in urban environments, you could sniff the DNA in the air and potentially identify animals <sighs> and maybe find animals that we've thought to be extinct. Mm -hmm. Who That's knows? the first thing I thought or, of is like, this looks like thylacine DNA. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking, I immediately went to the uh, 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 Borneo Calimantan monkey cat. Yes. That elusive creature that's been evading evading jungle cameras for, for decades now. <laughs> we will get the monkey cat. I love it. Yeah. So not just a DNA from the cells, right? Things that you leave in the dust and the dirt or in the water, but the air, which is, I think, pretty amazing. I think, I think yeah. it's just pretty awesome. All right. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to the show. We appreciate you being here with us. If you are enjoying it, please share it with a friend today. All right, we're going to come on back right now, and we will be giving our COVID update. <laughs> so, Blair, you yes. have a fun story. Yes, it's, it's a fun one. It's also extremely brief and simple. It's just that <laughs> um, in previous studies, researchers have shown that T cells induced by other coronaviruses can recognize SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. And th this new study examines for the first time how the presence of those same T cells at the time of SARS-CoV-2 exposure influences whether you become infected. So that would include T cells that you have due to infection from the common cold. So that is a oh. coronavirus, right? Um, so this provides a blueprint for a second generation universal vaccine that could prevent infection from current and future SARS-CoV-2 variants, including Omicron, because these T cells protect from COVID a little bit differently. Um, instead of attaching, um, going to the, the spike protein, they actually target internal proteins within the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So they're they're pretty much good against all the current and hopefully future variants. So this is a small sample study, 52 people. Um, they were all white and European. So again, very Limited. preliminary. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of variables that need to be tested here, but it would <sighs> appear that there is something to be learned here. This does not mean you are safe if you got the common cold from COVID. What this means is the methodology that these T cells use to try to protect you from other coronaviruses could be used to make other vaccines, which would be great. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't mean that uh, the the cold protects you, because you know what that would mean then? It would mean that all the people who never get colds because they wash their hands all the time and are very sanitary <laughs> and avoid sick people and are really good at it are the people who are dying. 
And what we're going to be left with is a population of non-hand washers who always catch colds. Hey, listen, I wash my hands very diligently (laughs) and I get sick multiple times a year, every year. Okay. Maybe that's why I haven't caught COVID yet. <laughs> it's possible. I mean, there's also the, it is winter. And if you are out and you've gotten colds because you are not a hand washer, you know, your body's immune system probably is elevating a temperature, getting some other immune cells activated. You have an inflammatory response that possibly could help to protect you as well. I mean, I'm just looking on the bright side here. I don't know. Rick Loveman, yeah, 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 you don't want to cure for the common cold. No, if we cured the common cold, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we'd all be in big trouble. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Justin, what was your story? Oh, uh, oh, I was just good news. Woohoo! COVID edition. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. Or- Oregon State University researchers identified a potential COVID blocker in hemp because... Of course they did. <laughs> but um bump. Thank as you, Oregon. As, as much as it sounds like a make it up story, actually, this looks uh, pretty promising. Uh, findings of the study led by Richard Van Bremen, a researcher with Oregon State's Global Hemp Innovation Center, were published in Journal of Natural Products. Okay, so far, eh, maybe. Uh, but they looked at hemp. This is cannabis sativa. Uh, and they found a pair of uh, cannabinoid acids within the hemp plant that bind to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So it actually attaches itself to the spike protein of the virus. Uh, So that blocks a critical step in the process the virus uses to infect people. So the the compounds are cannabigerolic acid, CBGA and cannab- uh, cannabidolic cannab- cannabidolic acid CBDA. Yeah. Cannabidolic so, cannabidolic. Yeah. The spike protein is the same one uh, that is used as the drug target, the same drug targets used in the vaccines and in the antibody therapy. And as the report points out, a drug target is any molecule that is critical to the process of the disease progressing. Yeah. Disrupt that one molecule if it's critical and the disease cannot progress. Uh, in this case, these these CBD precursors is basically what these are. Uh, do that job. It's so funny, though. It's like it, multiple times in this story, a Bremen is going on saying, these are not the controlled substances like THC, the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. The thing researchers are constantly having to explain whenever they're talking about Mm -hmm. using hemp for anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then later on, he explained that uh, it's not CBD itself, but these are CBD uh, molecular precursors, chemical precursors. So, yes, you're safe. You you won't feel mildly relaxed. Uh, (laughs) You you can go on being stressed out all day. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So the interesting uh, the, the interesting aspect of this so right this is just looking at molecules these molecules that happen to be ha- happen to be coming from hemp interact with the spike protein awesome but we don't know whether this is going to work in a, a human person. I mean, if you're all, if you if you enjoy your CBD gummies and you enjoy all those things, and fine, that's great. But don't think that that means you are protected against SARS-CoV-2. This is a study that has only shown affinity for the spike protein by these molecules. It is not showing that it's going to keep you safe. This isn't a treatment. This is not some, this is, this is the earliest stages of research. So I just, we need to say that because people are already just like, woo, yeah. we can't let this go down the bleach or the other well, roads. And this is one that they have tested that does, uh, does work on the spike protein. They were looking at a, uh, another compound in licorice that they haven't uh-huh. tested, but they think it will have uh, similar properties. But I think, I think one of the things that I found very interesting about this, these are precursors that are in some abundance in hemp. We did a story a couple years, two, maybe two years ago, uh, 
about uh, a researcher that was able to produce CBD via a, I believe he used yeast, uh, so in a bioreactor. And one of the things that was interesting about that that story then is because they're talking about this is part of research they're trying they're trying to use CBD to do maybe as a, a concussion protocol because it has some neuroregenerative properties something about CBD uh, and and the cannabinoids so we have they they interact very well with the human system whether humans have been interacting with hemp for a long time or hemp just happens to be a plant that interacts with human physiology very well. I don't know. But one of the things that was interesting in that is the, you know, many, many hundreds of other CBD like compounds, precursors and the rest that are produced in much smaller quantities uh, within hemp that mm -hmm. don't have a large enough uh, effect or, or placement that can actually be expressed uh, in that biotech -y way and then researched. Because it and it, so and here's a here's a pretty good example of now going back a step from CBD that we've already kind of know has some uses a precursor that could be utilized as medicine as well. This is a plant that uh, is as much as as it's it's talked about sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes feared for the wrong reasons and right. the right reasons. All that there's a lot of research that needs to be done still onto this plant and the compounds. Uh, so. Yeah, a bunch of research. I mean, this is it's looks interesting. It's promising, possibly, but this is not in humans. This was just in cells. More research needs to be done before people really dive into it as prevention and treatment for SARS-CoV-2. So I just want to say that over and over and over again, because it's great cell study. I mean, it's like when we talk about all sorts of other stuff and then we're like, oh, in mice. Mm -hmm. you know, Maybe it'll is... be ready for the next coronavirus. Yeah, maybe it'll be ready for the next one. Who knows? I mean, this is like licorice, this the CBD variants. Like, let's see. Yeah, more research. Let's put more money to it. I know that with the farm bill, hemp has a lot more research going uh, going on right now. So that in itself is cool. Oh, my goodness. We're not going to talk about any more COVID-related stuff other than the fact that today we have reached an all-time high of hospitalizations, cases, and um, oh, it's just not very great. Our healthcare system is imploding, so everybody, please wear your masks. Mm -hmm. If you can, stay home, stay home, please be safe. And uh, like Fauci said, we're probably all going to get it at some point, so yeah. Do your best. That, to get by vaccinated. the way, by the way, but anyway, that is no, we're not the on. attitude. That is I'm not sorry. the attitude I want I'm from from, I'm, from my Fauci. Sorry. No, you okay? I'm sorry, <laughs> Justin. I know the attitude should have been everybody toke one for the team and stay home oh, and one for the team? toke one toke for the team. One. Yeah, Netflix yeah. and chill for the next six weeks. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, but it's still like <laughs> the. When the guy who's the charge of like getting the message out prevention is just like smoke him oh, while you got it, like that's, that's it. no, no, you can't. That's, you that's it. He's done. He's done. That. He's tried. He's tried everything. He's tried so hard. You just can't. Oh god. This is this week in science. Thank you once again for joining us for this episode of our weekly science news talk show. If you would like to help support This Week in Science, you can head over to twist.org, click on our Patreon link, and choose your level of support. We have many levels to fit different budgets, $10 and more uh, a month, and you will be thanked by name at the end of the show. I can't wait. I can't wait to read your name. I love doing that, and I love having that list of names and getting, it, getting to share it with everybody. So I do hope that you will become a part of keeping this show going. We thank you for your support. We really can't do it without you. And now it is time to come back into the more animalistic part of the show. The show we know and love. Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, great and small. By pet, mill a pet, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals, she's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels, and I'm good for 
What you got, Blair? I have a story about a dog. This is a actually dog. yes, named Sadie. No, oh. this is a dog named Coon Coon. Um, okay. she, this dog <laughs> was owned by, is owned by Laura V. Kuaya, um, who's the first author on this new study I'm reporting on today. Um, she moved from Mexico to Hungary to join the Neuroethology of Communication Lab at the Department of Ethology at this Laurent University. And so the, when she did that, she wondered whether Kun Kun noticed that people in Budapest spoke a different language than the people in Mexico. We know from previous research that people, and this includes pre-verbal human infants, notice the difference between languages fundamentally in their brain. But we don't know if dogs know the difference between languages just by the fact that they sound different. So she designed a brain imaging study to see what was going on in Kun Kun's brain. Kun Kun and 17 other dogs were trained to lay motionless in a brain scanner while wearing headphones. Oh, what good doggies. Oh, what a very and good boy. They played speech excerpts of The Little Prince in Spanish and then in Hungarian. All dogs heard only one of the two languages from their owners previously. So one was familiar and one was not. They also played scrambled versions of those excerpts, which I'm sure sounded nightmarish, which sound completely unnatural and nonsensical to test whether they could detect a difference between speech and what they would consider non-speech. What they found was that there were distinct activity patterns in dogs' primary auditory cont uh, cortex if they were listening to speech versus non-speech. So they could tell right away if it was real language or if it was muddled up sounds. This... Distinction was independent from whether that stimuli originated from the film familiar or the unfamiliar language. So when they paired it with the one they were used to or not, they could still tell the difference between speech and non-speech, even if they didn't speak Hungarian. So that's step one. But they could also tell the difference between Spanish and Hungarian. They found language-specific activity patterns in their brains in another region, which is the secondary auditory cortex. But the older the dog was, the better they were at distinguishing between familiar and unfamiliar language based on their brain activity. So this suggests that during the time that dogs live with us, they pick up more and more on auditory regularities of the language that they hear every day. And so they are able to distinguish, okay, that's definitely speech, but I, it's totally unfamiliar and different. And they're able to distinguish that I don't know what's happening. It's not language, though. <laughs> so it's. I'm not surprised that they that dogs can figure out the difference between speech and non-speech. I mean, mm -hmm. dogs have. We've talked so many times about how attuned dogs are to human communication, to human wants, needs. You know, the ability to stay with their human as a member of the pack to take to take instruction that there's definitely the learning of certain words and certain mm -hmm. signals. So there's a couple there's a couple things about this study I want to point out. So one of them is the potential implications, but then I kind of want to poke a hole in the study just for fun because that's what we do Great. here, right? Um, yes. But so the implications here are a non-human can tell there's between languages. Can we do that the opposite way? Not without computer modeling. When we found out that hyraxes have different, um, what did they have? They had different dialects depending on where they lived. We couldn't tell that without using a computer. We couldn't tell that just by the our naked ear that the hyraxes mm -hmm. had a different um, Accent. I, I lost right. language here while we're talking about language. The language center of my brain <laughs> just shut down completely. Language but, goes. Um, they, ha they have a different accent or a different way of talking. So this is something that we can't do, I can say, with, pretty, with, with quite a bit of confidence. We know chimps, for example, have different, quote unquote, languages depending on where they, were gr they grew up. Um, and we can't tell that without computer modeling. But so... But, but, that, to, be fair, but to be fair... There's not a lot of humans that were raised by these chips. Right. Sure. Who've been sure. Been hearing mm -hmm. them every day. Who right. then might? Yeah. So that. So this is the second piece of that. Is this dog specific? 
Is it domesticated animal specific? Is it across the animal kingdom? Can they tell different human languages? So there's, there's a lot of interesting questions. Now, here is the hole I want to poke, though, in this study. All of the pictures I saw of this study had some sort of border collie type dog. Now, these dogs are not coincidentally very smart, very <laughs> smart and trainable. And therefore, yeah. they could be trained to wear a set of headphones and sit in an MRI machine. My dog could not do that. <laughs> so, but they're also famous for knowing 200 words for yeah. the collies, some of them. They're and, like the dog version of Alex the parrot. Right. You can say, go get Einstein <laughs> and they'll come back with their Einstein doll. So I think this could be very specific to the subset of dogs that were in this study because they are already extremely smart, extremely trainable, extremely focused on humans for those reasons. And on top of that, can learn the most human words out of pretty much all of the breeds. So this, so there is a weird accidental Venn diagram of like dogs that you could teach to sit in an MRI machine and dogs that can understand human language well, right? So if there was a way we could parse that out, I feel like this would be more accurate. Just looking at the, the study very quickly, their first table in the study names the breeds of the dogs. And oh, from the here. 19 animals, we have Labradoodle, mm -hmm. a mix, Golden Retriever, Border Collie, Cocker Spaniel, Australian Shepherd, and that's that's the yeah. those are the breeds of dogs, which are all fairly trainable and intelligent. Smart and Bunch human focused too. Yeah. 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 Very human focused. So I think it, this is very cool, very interesting, awesome to hear. Certainly something that we can't do in reverse. But we can't it could tell be between barking in, in Spain versus barking. Right, but it could be biased. South Africa. Because but, of yes. the speed because of the 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 types of dogs we're mm -hmm. looking at. No, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. now we just have to get the the dogs that don't care about people <laughs> to see if see if we can train them. Or they could just care, dogs. but like yeah. they could care, but also yeah. just not really be that interested in 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 doing an experiment. <laughs> right. If you could find a way to fit a hat on Sadie that she the could less shake helpful dogs. off, and that would give you brain readings, then I would believe it. Oh my gosh, I'm imagining a helmet on Sadie and she'll yeah. look like Vince Clotho, Clotho from um, Ghostbusters. The, never mind. Um, anyway, <laughs> speaking of helmets, let's talk about hats. Let's or talk about hats. pants or sleeping bags. I don't know. So this is a story about orb weavers from, um, from Australia. This is the leaf curling spider. It is a uh, Phononatha griffii, and they are a type of orb weaver that is known for curling leaves into their webs. They use that leaf, they shimmy into it with their abdomen. Oh, there we go. Um, so they, they shimmy into it, and they still have their, their legs sticking out, touching their webs, so they can tell what's going on around them, they can see, they can sense. But that leaf serves a really important purpose. Um, it it actually protects them from predators like birds. It, it, they are hidden in it. And it also shields them from parasitic wasps, which are famous for laying eggs on the bodies of other insects and spiders, which kill their hosts. So they, they're protecting themselves. They actually use spider silk to lift a leaf up, leaf up from the ground into their web. They put it in the middle of their orb web, and then they curl it up and secure it with silk. They roll it up like a sleeping bag, and then they shimmy on in. And so um, this, is, this is a really interesting study because they, they only leave that little leaf to eat, really. Um, but what I found even more interesting is that they will actually shack up with their partner. So a lot of spiders we've talked about on the show, um, the, the males show up to copulate with the female and that's it. They're lucky to get away with their lives often not with their genitals, but their lives for the time being. Um, sometimes they're eaten. It's a whole thing. 
But in this case, a lot of the time, um, males and females will form pairs and share their little leaf sleeping bag. The males will move in with the females when she's still young. That's how they do it without getting eaten. Um, and then once she's mature, she'll, uh, they'll mate with her. Um, but they still do sometimes cannibalize the males. Of course, you know, it wouldn't be a spider without that. That occurs independently of whether the female has been deprived of food or not. So it's just kind of if she feels like it, if he's bugging her. Um, but after mating, the female actually makes another curled leaf retreat in vegetation away from the web. And this is her nursery little leaf. So that's where she lays her eggs. Talk so this about is... nesting. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So they're nesting. They're, they're adapting their environment around them to respond to threats. This is, in my opinion, 100% some real tool use being used by these spiders in their webs to augment their their webs with something more than the webbing that they create and so that i just i love this story i think it's so fun that the orb orb weavers are like i'm kind of exposed out here oh there's a leaf down there what if i just curl it up around myself I'll, I'll still i'll be out there i can still tell when stuff's going on i'm not going to block my face but i'll be protected it's like a nice coat or a, a hat or what do you think if it's on their their abdomen what do you think it is is it pants? It's I a think skirt. It's a, I think uh, I would go further. I would call it a shelter. <laughs> I, I would call it shelter, and I would say yeah. that, uh, that 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 might mean that uh, orb weavers invented shelter, uh, depending on how long they've been doing this before humans. Yeah, we might, we'd, do, we'd go run into a cave, you know. But building your own uh, shelter? Yeah, they're the original campers. Yeah, they pitched their little tent and. But you, I mean, you described it as a lot tent, of things. You know, tent. It sounds like it's partly armor uh, from, from you know, getting uh, eggs laid in you while you sleep or something horrible happening to you. Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting thing is that when they're younger, so orb rivers only live a year, by the way. Oh. But when they're, when they're younger, uh, if they're not strong and big enough to pick up a big dried leaf, they'll use a fresh, smaller leaf. Or sometimes they'll use snail shells or a piece of paper. Wow. So if you see a piece of tr what you assume is trash in a web, might actually be a little spider living in there. So I'd love to know if it's more some species. That's ability too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, that's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, using, I mean, this is tool use, right? Mm -hmm. If, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if it's used for a purpose, um, is it instinctual? Is it, uh, you know, when does it happen? I mean, you've talked before about the the, the complexity, the chaotic nature of, of spider mating, of the males mm -hmm. spiraling into the females and, you know, how order comes from that. Is this yeah. one of those things or is it, uh, I mean, is this spider planning? Is this something that worked a lot at one point and then it's just ingrained now because it just worked really well do other spider species do this beside these australian spiders and you bring up a good point there too about the whether or not this is instinct so i, right. I don't know that i i don't know that spiders go to a spider engineering university to learn how to make their webs but they all nope. do it yeah. so there you know there's something more than just instinct to have web instinct to have shelter or to wrap thing there is genetic memory somehow being passed down on how to do things there is but there's also adaptive learning throughout their life so mm -hmm. the the kind of orb weavers that we have here in uh in my area some of those are the ones that take down their web every night and put it back up in the morning so it's so clean that bugs can't see it and they walk right into it they also do it usually at face level and it's so clean that you can't see it which is <laughs> yeah. the right. worst the bane of but, players existence one day we'll catch one of those humans and when we do we will eat forever oh man i mean orb weavers don't even they're not even venomous to humans but anyway um the the crazy thing about that is if you knock one down, if it's like, get out, this is right in my face and you, and you get a stick and you like nicely move the spider, very important piece. And then you knock down their web. They won't build it there again. Mm -hmm. They will build it All somewhere right. else. And in this case, they, 
change what types of material they use to make their leaf depending on what they are capable of lifting and what is available. So there's there's adaptation happening here within their lifespan where they know they're trying to get themselves it's it's pretty clear they're getting to a goal. I don't know if it's instincts or something else that's telling them they need to get the, to that goal, but the fact that they can adapt their procedures to get to where they're going to get themselves their little shelter, that that means there's something more than just I put leaf in web. <laughs> there's something more there, going on. Yeah, and it's their little bit of shelter, but at the same time, maybe that little bit of leaf or whatever could also be an attractant to an insect or something. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it also helps them eat. Mm -hmm. They're hiding in there. The insect is like, ooh, what's that? And then they're like, ah, I got you. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Oh, spiders. The more we learn about the spiders, the more the more I love them, the more I appreciate all the spiders of the world. I still don't know if I will go into the basement of my childhood home where all the black black widow spiders live no. under the stairs, you know, yeah, but, but I still appreciate them a lot. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Justin, it's your turn. What do oh. you have for us now? War ponies? Or yeah, let's do it. So uh, okay. medieval times uh, evoke... A number of colorful images and imaginings, uh, mostly of filthy peasants working fields and a general lack of hygiene and scientific understanding, but also of the brave knight, resplendent in his shiny armor, sitting high upon his trusty steed, the mighty warhorse, too resplendent in armor, perhaps, a beast of good breeding and powerful athleticism, the very essence and envy of what all horses aspire to be, and while huge uh, sums were spent on breeding and training and keeping horses for combat, as, as much for actual warfare as for local symbols of power and authority, turns out medieval war horses, as you uh, uh, were leading into there, were no more than pony-sized. New study is showing horses during the medieval period just weren't big. <laughs> We're not that big yet, at least. A team of archaeologists and historians have found that they, they were not even bred for size. That wasn't even the thing that they were shooting for. Uh, back then, they were just... The success uh, for inbreeding was, was for things like uh, temperament. They, they, if they, they, they wanted long distance, Fierce raiding. Uh, yeah, they wanted... They'd be in, in tournaments. Uh, but they had to, the, you know, just... They just wanted horses that would listen. <laughs> that was like apparently the high bar. Uh, and also maybe, uh, you know, maybe the knights weren't as tall. As, I was going to uh, say, I wonder if people were not as heavy. Because, yeah, tall, but also the, the thing I'd be really thinking about would be how heavy. Because especially people are wearing armor as armor. well. Yeah. So, okay. So then picture a very robust pony. Right? <laughs> like this is, this is Ugh. like the knight is riding into battle with the jousting stick heels just inches off the ground probably lifting them <laughs> up so as not to drag in the dirt this is not this just totally changes the picture uh of how they have to be portrayed from now on in every movie you can have no larger than a pony so even even the tallest the the biggest horse they ever found and this is an uh from an era of uh, 300 to six, all the way up to 1600 or 1300. They, the biggest horse they found, it would be considered a small riding horse today. And that's the biggest one ever found in the, in the records from then. Uh, but yeah, they, they they were focused on the temperament, you know, just getting horses to pay attention. That's all they really wanted. Knights on ponies. Keep mm. that image. Make sure that's make sure that if you see any of those historical documentary reenactment things, make sure they're not using big horses. So nobody had looked at the bones before to really check and see how big these war horses were. What I mean, because we've got stories of like you know we look at the horses now and say these are the breeds that were the yeah. war horses of the past, and 
Well, no, they, know, what they do is we, they put movies, they put the biggest horse out there. That's the war horse. It's the big, powerful, strong horse with a tall knight on it and everything like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when they specifically went back and looked for horses that were being bred uh, anywhere, really, but uh, specifically the ones that were being uh, part of breeding programs that would have been used for combat and trained for combat. Yeah, not that big. Not that big. <laughs> Very small horses, in fact. Yeah, ponies. Well, they were. They were small. Yeah, in small in stature, but maybe stocky, so that they could have the weight of the the armor, like Blair maybe had not. said. So maybe, maybe little they stocky just ponies. Heavily. <laughs> Panting stocky ponies. I, yeah. So the image that we have of, of the war horse did eventually come about uh, in the late 1600s at a time mm. when getting into the time where they started to become more ornamental. You know, where there was a period Got of it. time there where they may have actually, you know, uh, really been used as war horses for like a little while. But by the time you got the big horses, it was over with. Uh, the, the knights riding into battle on horseback, that, that wasn't a thing anymore. Nobody was doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Awesome. But yeah, uh, serious question, Fadi, and you're right. Yeah, average human height was also smaller back then. Uh, those large horses, if they had them, if they had them, well, it just been too hard to get on uh, in the saddle. It's, I would think in, in um, battle, it would be a strategic advantage to be higher up. Yeah, but uh, but then also mounted, the, then then infantry that's on foot, and 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 other than that, it was all infantry, right? So mm -hmm. the, that was the other thing is just having a horse and being able to go with places quickly, or you know, send your your probably used more internally than they were for an external war in terms of like you know those those filthy uh, peasants uh, working your farm day and night. It's not because they necessarily wanted to be there; it's they didn't want to get run through with a lance if they didn't go to work that day. So. There was a lot of other dynamics. But yeah, that was a huge... So that's going on over there in the UK. Now, around the same time period, uh, 500 or 1100, the highlands of Peru were home to the Wari people. The Ooh. Wari culture uh, is spread over vast distances, the rugged terrain of the Andes Mountains, and, and long, long days, like huge territory the Wari uh, controlled. This is before the Incas even existed. New finds from a small site in Peru suggest the, these worry uh, culture may have forged their political alliances and authority by serving drug-laced beer to the local elites uh, <laughs> in, in, other, in other villages. That's how uh, you make friends, huh? <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm new to the neighborhood. Want to come over, have some drinks, some dinner? Disclaimer: oh. Do not do that at home. <laughs> no, 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 no. Take no, back no. that disclaimer. If you are a government, <laughs> and instead of sending the military to go fight uh, another country, maybe send them your best drugs. Maybe like, hey, as long as they know they're drinking party drugs. instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they weren't like. So, so a great question, yeah, because it's drug laced beer, right? Yeah. So that is an important point because the drug uh, is a jungle drug that didn't grow right. Like one of the places was 800 kilometers from their capital. Uh, they found this outpost. That's where some of this research is done. The drug that they're bringing with them is something that's found deep in the jungles and places far, far away from where this little outpost is. Uh, it's something that you can pulverize into a powder. It gives a very strong hallucinogenic out-of-body type experience. It's a very intense drug. Turns out when you mix this drug with beer, which the locals were making, it has a much milder calming sort of effect where it's more like a party thing. Everybody feels good and wants to socialize and talk and feels nice. So basically what they found was that the outpost only inside the Wari's little small outpost, which could have had no more than 100 people in this larger region, was all of the crushed seeds from this hallucinogenic drug. Outside of that was where the local villagers did their brewing and they would find the combinations of the of these this drug and the, the alcohol 
So they would have people come over to specifically do the, the drug with the alcohol with them at these parties. Now, fantastic. I love that story. Part of what I really love about this story, this is like, I think the first time going back into the record, I've heard about drugs being used for any form of recreation. Uh, they yep. always are going like, oh, religious well, the ceremony ancients or... had to be a religious ritual ceremony because yeah. all those people did was be in awe of deities and then, you know, whatever else they did all day, who cares? They just did ritual uh, worship. Stuff. No, they went, they partied with the foreigners and they established trade routes based on that and goodwill and everything else. And then, and it's interesting too, because that, that village 800 kilometers away took on all of the cultural adornments of the Wari people, the pottery, the housing styles, all of that. But there was no evidence of enslavement or warfare or bloodshed around it. Just the arrival of the cocktails. That's all it took. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to we, we, we don't need to fight we don't need to fight i've got i've got a better idea <laughs> maybe this is why americans cling to the idea of quote unquote the first thanksgiving so hard because if that's actually how it had gone things might have gone much better a bit better just would have shared some nice food and drink with your new neighbors but no yeah, would have been nice food happened. and drugged drink yeah okay. <laughs> little little hallucination with your new friends yeah. <laughs> oh, i don't mind as we as we dig back in the the archaeological record i'm sure we'll, we'll find more evidence of non-ceremonial uses i'm and, you know yeah. it's in it, it, there's going to be a lot more going and on. And there actually is within the Wari people. They uh, have a lot of artwork on pottery and other things showing uh, the seed pods from this Vilka plant, uh, as well as as well as well uh, sort of festivities around it. So they they definitely had a party culture and, and ran an empire of, of partying. Like that, why, when's the last time you've seen this? When's the last time this is? I don't know, know college maybe. Yeah, I, I was know. gonna say Greek row. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're almost to the end of the show here. I have a couple more stories, a couple more stories, and I'm so excited about these stories. Uh, let's talk about fingerprints. I want you to look at your fingers, and look at your fingerprints, and mm -hmm. you've probably got some little ridges if you haven't burned all your fingerprints off accidentally doing well i don't know whatever but how about, how about martin scars <laughs> right <laughs> martin scars whatever you may have lost some fingerprints depending upon your age but uh -huh. each and every one of us has unique fingerprints it's why you can get fingerprinted and put your fingerprints on record so people can identify you it's this very special unique marker yes. and what unique unique ish i mean there's uh, there's like a uh, they're pretty they can be pretty similar actually they too. can be very like, similar they're, but they're, they're not as unique as people think they're but. very you they are very unique with other you know they, they can be used to identify people mm. so we've got our we've got the the radial loops we've got arches there are whorls um and these different patterns People have wondered where they come from yeah. for a very long time. How do, how, yeah, how, do, how do they come about? They come about during embryonic development. They start to form about the third month in utero, and they develop and change as the baby is growing. And so they are definitely genetically linked, but which genes control them? Well, some researchers in China decided to take a look at it. And as they dug in to identify the genes that were responsible for fingerprints, they found that they are also, there were a number of genes. One in particular um, these is related to limb development. So as the limbs grow, the fingerprints get their shapes. And those loops and arches and whorls, the researchers think, might be from the impact of how the growth takes place. And so maybe as the bones grow and push outward, that it that 
pressure from the growth of the bones influences the skin and how these huh. ridges and whorls and loops form. So I never realized, I'm looking at my own fingers right now. I never realized, is that normal that you have kind of, you're, you showed us these six different kinds of um, types of fingerprints you could have, that you have the same across all your fingers usually? You don't necessarily have the okay. same across all your fingers. No, um, they can be different. It depends. But they have they have found very specific patterns, which is is kind of cool. So um, they have discovered that there are uh, particular particular things. People with whorls in their fingerprints on both of the little fingers tend to have longer little fingers than people who do not. And this correlation is also linked to the genes involved with limb development. Interesting. Yeah. So there are very specific patterns that tend to pop up more or less uh, frequently, depending. Um, and they, they think that it may be force related. Um, that the, like I mentioned, that the, as the growth takes place, the, everything stretches and elongates and there's pressure that's involved from that growth. And that, might change what the shapes of the fingerprints look like. It might actually influence them. And so that might be why it happens. Um, but there are also congenital disorders that are linked to what they call dermatoglyphic patterns. This is the new word of the day, dermatoglyphic. Um, finger, fingerprints or the lines in your palms. Mm -hmm. Those are dermatoglyphs. So uh, children with Down syndrome are likely to have a single crease running across the palm of their hands, uh, but they're, this could also be affected by developmental genes. And so there's a theoretical basis for this kind of pleiotropy, the researchers say. Pleiotropy being where you have multiple traits affected by similar genes, by the mm -hmm. same genes. You know what I've mm -hmm. noticed is that the older that I've gotten, uh, my fingerprints have vanished mm -hmm. kind of a, yeah. right along with my eyesight. Well, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I think <laughs> I need to go get my glasses <laughs> so yeah. that I can actually see yeah. my fingerprints now. Because <laughs> I you know I used to have them and I'm wearing glasses, but I don't know <laughs> what where they went because they're just gone. I used to be able to look down and see them. They're yeah, not there anymore. See anymore. And without the glasses, I barely have hands. Well, so, maybe you don't get to have so fingerprints mitten. anymore because we're, we're in the shrinking stage. I don't know. No, not yet. Oh, my gosh. Not yet. That's fascinating. I want to learn more about fingerprints. Fingerprints are fascinating. I've yeah, never really so. looked at mine, and now I'm I'm very... <laughs> Fingerprint-focused. Yeah, good. it's really interesting. Should I have so many <laughs> creases? In my fingerprints? I have a lot like, of creases. In okay, I've got yes. a ton now. Oh my yes. goodness. I love That's all it. I can see. I can't see the I hope everybody is, except if you're driving, staring at your fingers. <laughs> yeah. no. Wait until you're driving. Light, then you can Please look. keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> Uh, last story for the night. There is some new research into CAR T uh, therapies. So, mm. CAR T therapy is. Uh, is therapy where normally T cells, which are immune cells, as, as we know, get removed from the body and engineered to express a receptor, the CAR receptor. Now, the CAR receptor then identifies or latches onto markers on the outside of cancer cells. And so then CAR T cells, the T cells, because they're attached to that receptor that then is attached to a, uh, a cancer cell, um, can destroy the cancer cells. And so this is how the CAR T therapy through this genetic engineering enables um, the treatment of some cancers. Mm -hmm. This last week in science, researchers have published their work in which they no longer have to take cells out of the body to engineer them to uh, express the CAR protein. They, in their work in mice, this is once again in mice, and uh, so in working in mice, they, from the University of Pens Pennsylvania, they were able to get um, these car cells produced in the body uh, using mRNA 
using mRNA like uh. the like the uh, Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines. They injected mRNA to get the T cells in the mice to produce the chimeric antigen receptor, the CAR receptor. Wow. And this CAR receptor, what it what they had it do in this particular study was target the um, fi it's a fibroblast activating protein. And the fibroblast activating protein, what they did is this fi in scar tissue formation, fibroblasts, this activating protein is stimulated. This is a problem in cardiac disease. If you have high blood pressure and um, and problems with the heart, which they uh, they made a model of this in the mice, so they gave mice heart problems. The 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 mice started to produce these fibroids, fibrotic tissue in the heart, scar tissue with this fib, uh, fib, fibroblast activating protein. They did the mRNA treatment. The CAR T cells then latched on to the scar tissue, reduced the scar tissue in the hearts to the point that they were just about like normal hearts. Now, the cool thing about this, if you do the take the immune cells out of the body and then put them back into the body procedure, you end up with these T cells, these CAR T cells running around the body and they're there all the time. And this can actually be a problem and researchers would like it to be more transient. And so with the mRNA, it produces a transient response and they showed that these CAR T cells, what they're calling fat CAR positive T cells in mice, they were pretty much gone about a week after injection. They didn't see any more expression. Now, there are still a bunch of questions as to how this could work in people, but it could be uh, used not only for this fibroblast activating protein. It can be used to attack cancers. It can be used to attack um, all sorts of things and to develop just about any novel therapy that you could probably think of. So, wow. Justin, yeah, like, Justin, you've been talking about this CAR-T stuff for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I just think, like, this is the next step that is going to take it to the next level. And we're, we're starting to look at it as, like, this is going to make a real difference in people's lives combined yeah. with RNA. I mean, it's already been shown to be able to knock out leukemia in a patient yeah. within 48 hours. Uh and 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 persist in that case uh, in a way that prevents them from getting it again. Um, the one of the, the things is that had also there was a percentage of people who would just die from it uh, yeah. from going undergoing that procedure. The other part of it was that it cost two million dollars for one person to undergo yeah. that treatment, and that had to be you know that was taking cells out re-engineering them uh like with a shelled out hiv i think it was and then mm -hmm. reintroducing uh right so and so if it's got a, if they've it's, got a yeah yeah i was gonna say it's limited in location because not every hospital or treatment center is going to have all the equipment that would be necessary for oh, the yeah, procedure yeah. and and so this it's almost like uh, you know the mrna vaccine it, yeah oh, there's your vaccine you'd maybe come in and have an injection or and you're an coming into the, and, not even this facility that's uh, that's even you know you've got a facility that one facility that can do these treatments can now package it anywhere send it anywhere oh this is huge Very and good. if you can think about anything you know that you uh, like any aberrant what the researchers say you know uh, one of the researchers says it's groundbreaking because it's a whole new way of thinking about a therapeutic application redirecting the T cell to control other aberrant cells. So we think of, you know, cancer cells as being aberrant, but like what other cells, what other, what other things are potentially going wrong that in the body at different points in time that yeah, could and, be and that's old. A, and that's also the, the thing about the, the leukemia was that leukemia is white blood cells that have become uh, cancerous. There's yeah. slightly different. So they, they're, these you have, you've trained white blood cells, T cells to attack white blood cells. That are the you know have infected or built wrong or however you want to want to put it that are cancerous, in, in that they're being produced and that they're non effective. So it was able to identify. So it can be very strategically targeted, 
uh, so yeah, fantastic to find out they've got a uh, new, better, cheaper, faster uh, method available in mice. In mice. <laughs> yes, in mice. And then that'll be the next step. Can yeah. we use this in people and will it help? So it's very exciting. I think we will hear a lot more about this probably in the not too far off future. But the future is coming. It's here. The future that you didn't want to wait for. The end of the show. Oh. And we made it to the end of the show. We did it. We might have. We did it. We made it to the end of the show. Happy anniversary, Blair. Oh, right. I forgot about that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I brought all the animal stories today then. That's oh, it was, you brought the spiders, you brought sex, you brought it all. Dogs. Dogs and, and dog. MRI machines, always good. Dogs. Yes. Oh. It's very, very exciting to have you be part of the show and have yeah. you, have you being part of the show for such a long time now and it, the show would not be this great without you. Well, thanks. I wouldn't be the same <laughs> without this show. So I appreciate yeah. that as well. Yeah, we appreciate we appreciate you, Blair, so much. So everyone, if you can uh, take some time to wish Blair happy anniversary. It is her 10th anniversary here ten on Twist. years. She's been with us oh my for goodness. 10 years talking about animals invertebrate sex all the fun stuff <laughs> wow. spiders poop where do we where do we what do we, we get know. you out of high school 10 years yeah, i wish <laughs> <laughs> almost Couldn't, yeah it was probably wasn't that far away huh that close <laughs> yeah my goodness well we can aim for another 10 yeah let's do it okay Ten more years of animals in the pipeline. Yeah, why not? I got nothing else planned. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, thank you for joining us for this episode. We hope that you've been around for a long time, enjoying Blair's additions to the show. We hope that you will be around for many years to come to continue enjoying Blair's additions to the show. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very glad just to have you here with us tonight. So thank you all for another episode. And thank you. There's time for some shout outs to people. Thank you, Fada. Thank you for your help in doing show notes and the, uh, what else? Oh, social media. That's the big one. That is the big one. Thank you so much for that. And Gord and Arn Lore, thank you for your work keeping things decent in the chat rooms. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you so much for your editing and assistance. I do appreciate it. And to all of you patrons, thank you for your support on Patreon. Oh, I got thanks for you. Thank you, too. Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazard, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Don Munda, Stephen Albaran, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Marques and Flo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Romney Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artie Am, Greg Brids, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, hey, Arizona, support Aaron Lieberman for governor, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Mallory Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapo, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Old State Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, Patrick Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show, 
We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and our Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you work in your garden outside, you know, trim some leaves, pull some weeds. Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, you can get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, notes to the stories and links to them will be available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up for a newsletter. You can also still buy calendars there if you don't have a calendar, right? Oh, I know. Are we are we all out? No, no we're I'm not all out yet. Very we're close. Not out yet. So you can definitely Stay buy fine. a calendar. It's still January. Yep. There's still time. Um, you can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist T W I S in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into an audio recording that is piped into headphones on the head of a dog and they'll be able to tell whether it's in English or another language but they won't know what it means and they won't be able to tell us about it so <laughs> yeah darn so then you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at twist science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson fly and at Blair's menagerie we love your feedback if there's a subject you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview a haiku that comes to the night please let us know we'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news and if you've learned anything from the show remember it's all in your head <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. made it to the end to the end of science no the end of this week in science yes the end this is the end beautiful friend the end of this week in sciences episode Hey everybody, Blair's tired. It's because Sorry. she's she's been doing this show for ten years, so she's <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> That'll happen. It will happen. Oh my goodness. Hey Blair, remember when um when you did this cute short? Oh wait. Let me turn it up. How come it's so quiet? Hold on. Oh, because I turned it way down. That's why. This is probably going to. Good science to you all. This is Blair Bazdrich for This Week in Science, coming to your eyes and ears from the Exploratorium in San Francisco, <gasps> California. Let's go inside and talk about some science news. What's happening? What's happening? study from Ocelogia has demonstrated plants have long 
from memory. They experimented with a very special plant, this plant, Mimosa pudica. Mimosas are special because when you touch them, they react. Mimosas can actually get quite big. Um, we went they to... They are crawling plants. Where do we go, so Blair? As they grow, we explore they explore it's and when more you still lived in San Francisco. Things. Here at the museum, we trim them um, so they stay Years nice and ago. They That was what, probably 2014? Like and a humid hot. Let me see. What year does this? Yeah, 2014. Yep. Then we had a fun interview. Yeah. That's I love that. That's still one of my favorite studies. They they put these plants on a um on a slide and dropped them down like 10 feet on a slide. And so when they landed, they went, oh, and they closed all up. <laughs> yeah, the plants are like, ow. Yeah, but they landed on soft mats. So then the next time that they dropped them, they didn't they didn't close up. They were like, oh, I know how this works. Wee! <laughs> so they have memory. Let's see. I'm moving further back in time. March, February. Oh, one more page. I'm sure. 300. January. Oh, What? Must have published things at weird times. 282? No. 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 I think I must have published a whole bunch of stuff at an odd time. Here, yeah, episode, what is this? 354. I don't think that's the first one, but I think it's no, close. No, it's January 20. This is January 26th. Yeah, so that's like the second or third one. Mm -hmm. Probably the third second one. The third one. So it was probably 52. Oh, this was... Smaller, so apparently the Bowers... The Bower birds. They all look different, but they're all open-ended. So there's two ends to it. And they found that if there was an enclosed bower, the female that. wouldn't even go in because she would think she would be trapped and she couldn't get away. So I don't know if also they look less intimidating, less scary to her. They even said also in there that... I'm watching the video, you like very red just lipstick. to confuse her and kind of daze her because when, she, when they're <laughs> that's, done... That's the best tactic. Leave yeah. the girl dazed and confused. <laughs> when, when they're done, they just kind of run around back real quick and mate. So I don't know... If they're just trying to get their, her confused and dazed enough, long enough to just sneak in there. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> those are those simple-minded, evil-minded <laughs> female power birds. Yeah. <laughs> they just can't. <laughs> You're did, like, yeah. Did you say 352? Three, that was 354. So it uh, must have been 352. Episode to... 352. It says nope. is 2015, so that's wrong. That's wrong. Is it 2.52? No. No, that's not right. And these are numbers That's wrong. not right. Let me go back to, let's see, Firefox. Uh, in this episode, 19 January 2012, it was Blair's Animal House. Yeah, so that's so probably it was the week before that was my very first mm -hmm. one. So did I? Does it say what I talked about? The that one? which is about our electricity. That okay, electricity and studied its effects on. So maybe a forwarding burger. happy meals. The snakes are actually paying attention to the heartbeat, and okay, then here we go. When it stops, they. And maybe a burger in there and I can just go away and I've got my toy, which which would be fine. That had actually be happier, but sometimes it's just for the toy. But then yeah, that's like their that's the reason they want to go there is because they know there's gonna be some sort of We were of, talking about happy um, meals, branded, Justin. Movie branded right. other you know, like other no movie branded thing that's it's gonna be in the back. I, I have a very distinct voice. That's like that little yeah. toy in the bottom of the cracker jack box. Yeah, yeah, those are cool. To the bottom box, or the or the toy in oh. the bottom of the cereal box that you have. There's to, Animal you know, House is coming up here box in a to, get, to get to the toy without even <laughs> even I, eating any of the cereal. Is this the after show? <laughs> Did she do her first exactly. story in the after show? Uh, we have a first a first timer here. 
for stories. Oh. All right. Yeah, Blair, our intern, brought a couple of stories today. And so we are going to intern. <laughs> She's horrifying. Okay, so I actually have two stories about animals. Shocking. <laughs> but they're both kind of related. They're about energy conservation tools that they discovered this week. And they're both in relation to feeding ap- adaptations in the animals. So the first one is about snakes. And of course, most snakes are constrictors. And that's kind of an extreme adaptation. Not a lot of animals do that. And so they found this week that snakes can sense a prey item's heartbeat. So they that way they know how long and how hard to constrict their prey animals. And so they use the least possible energy to get their food that way. So the way they did that is they actually took rats that had been previously euthanized and frozen. They warmed them back up and they placed artificial hearts inside of them. The hearts are basically a fluid filled bulb that had that they could control. They could turn on or off. They could speed up the heartbeat. They could slow down the heartbeat. And they also fitted the rats with pressure sensors so they could record constricting strength. Cool. And so they actually found that snakes constricted longer and with greater total pressure with rats that had an artificial heart than rats with no heartbeat whatsoever. They also found that when they stopped the the heartbeat during the constriction, the snakes abandoned their constriction shortly after they stopped it. So that means they were paying attention to the heartbeat as they were constricting. They also, when they kept the heartbeat going longer than a real live rat would have a heartbeat if they were being constricted, the snakes continued to squeeze. And some of them squeezed for up to 22 minutes, which is the longest ever recorded constriction time with snakes. So that really shows you that the snakes were responding to the heartbeat. And that would be beneficial to them because it turns out that snakes' metabolic rate, they can increase up to seven times when they're constricting their prey. That way they can really conserve their energy through... Uh, their special adaptation there for constricting. Um, So that's really cool. I mean, I would have assumed that snakes could sense a heartbeat, but they actually have some proof here. So that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it it seems interesting to me, the idea that uh, the snakes are actually (laughs) paying attention to the heartbeat and that that was a great first story. Well done, I feel bad yeah. because I'm I'm listening and in the background I could hear Kai. Yeah, and then hear I'm like, you can hear my chair squeak because I came back to the microphone. So obviously I was like off doing <laughs> like Blair's got it. Okay. So your first story, I was already just like, okay, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Ah, that's fantastic. So okay, so episode that episode was my first one. So the problem is um in the on the website under broadcasts, they we don't have show numbers that far back. No, we did. weren't do we weren't counting show numbers yeah. that far back. But so that was my first time I reported the show. Before that was the very mm-hmm. first time I I was around, and so I was just in the background, like monitoring the chat and mm-hmm. pulling links and stuff. And then I think you introduced me in the after show that first week. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, here, bring a story. You're in. Yeah. So I think I, <laughs> if I, if I may, what I recall, it was 10 years ago, but what I recall yeah. is that in between that first week and the second week, you said like, Oh, do some research. Here's some places to go look at stories and um, put a couple things that you might find interesting in our Facebook group. And I did that. And then (laughs) somehow between that and the next week, you were like, bring some stories. (laughs) Yep. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So you're trying to ease me in through like the the kiddie pool. Just like, you know, just just put some stories on the Facebook. No big deal. Yeah. And and then you're like, oh, sounds like deep end shove. (laughs) (laughs) I'm very happy about yeah Obviously. well you did that was a that was a really uh if uh, if i didn't know if i just heard this oh you know, here's an old uh thing about the that blair did about snakes once on the you know animal corner would not have guessed that was the first uh at all it's not very comfortable very at ease uh you know being in the broadcast mm-hmm. booth. yeah very much uh dan on youtube says that must have been some confused snakes. Like, why won't it die? Yeah. <laughs> this is the first time my food has acted this way. 
I also kind of want to know if they eventually stopped the heart and then it, that the that the uh, the longest recorded constriction event of all time, 22 minutes or whatever it was, or if the snake just gave up. The snake gave like, up. So if I up. if I recall correctly, done. they wanted to see what the outer limit was. How long yeah. is a snake willing to squeeze before they're like, fine, you earned it. You might go live <laughs> your life. <laughs> No sunk cost fallacy for me. I, and they're from Madagascar. Oh, they're the go. largest the nocturnal one. primate, and they're actually in the lemur family. And they're so mm -hmm. odd looking. They have this especially long, Hold pointy, on. bony middle finger. And in Madagascar, and if you don't know what an eye, eye, eye is, I would suggest okay. you Google a picture of them. They're really crazy yeah. looking animals. It's How a would I start to spell a -Y -E, that? A Y E, A Y E. <laughs> An I I, and they're from Madagascar. They're the largest nocturnal primate, and they're actually in the lemur family. And they're so mm -hmm. odd looking. They have this especially long, pointy, bony middle finger. Oh, right. And in Madagascar, if they if you come across an I I and it points at you with that long finger, it means you're going to die. <laughs> oh gosh! It gives you the middle finger. Yeah. Oh no! Wow. Now they use those fingers to get their food. They eat mostly grubs, and they'll they'll tap on the on trees and they'll listen for a hollow part. They actually have nerve endings in their fingers that are specialized to feel if it's hollow there too. And that's usually where grubs are. And then they'll use their extremely strong, sharp teeth to gnaw through the tree and they use that long finger to poke out those grubs to eat them. <laughs> now, uh, those long bony mingle, middle fingers, they, because they're so long and skinny, they have a really high surface area to volume ratio. So it has the opportunity to lose a lot of heat through that. And they did thermal imaging. And actually, it's funny, I found out they did some of this at the San Francisco Zoo where I work. And they found those middle fingers in the thermal imaging to be almost black most of the time. Now, it turns out they actually take those middle fingers and they bend them backwards to, they think, to keep them out of the way because they're so bony and skinny, they're very fragile. So when they're not using them when they're walking, they're bent back. But now they're starting to think that maybe when they bend those back, it's constricting, it's kinking the blood vessels. So it keeps right. blood from going to their fingers. And they took images of them when they were just walking around and when they were using the fingers to eat and their temperature in that finger raised four to six degrees Celsius when they were eating versus when they were just walking around. So that's another really cool way that they have this odd adaptation that potentially could have a drawback to it. And they found a way to take away that drawback. And what I think is really interesting about both of these articles is I can't help but wonder if both of these things developed simultaneously in the animal that the eye got the long finger and also the ability to kink that blood vessel at the same time, or if they developed that afterwards to take care of the drawback that presented itself. It's a really interesting question. Yeah, or whether or not the um, whether or not the behavior came later. Right. So, knowing that they have the long, skinny finger mm -hmm. and moving it back kinks the blood vessel. You know, maybe the the behavior of using of of pulling it back. I'm uh, a freak. To save, I've got to this long them. finger. Why would <laughs> this is all it does is break and get in the way, and I got nothing. Ah, I wish I didn't. Yeah. Oh, I just got a grub. Oh. oh, hey, <laughs> I can use this. Yeah, I got this great finger. I can stab stuff with it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's... Well, and just like with the snakes, I wonder if they were constricting things first and then all of a sudden they could feel the heartbeat and then they found an easier way to do that. They got it was... good at it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's the that evidence? Been... Aye, aye, Blair. Aye, aye. Hi, Sadie. <laughs> Hi, Sadie. I'm going to make you a Vince Clotho helmet for Halloween. It's the turkey. The turkey can do it. <laughs> no, not quite. You can go over your nose, though. Okay, we're going to go from I.I. to Vince Clotho. Come yeah. on. Very good. Let's, ma let's make Sadie <laughs> for Halloween. I think it would be great. That's great. I love it. It's a great idea. <laughs> I know just who can do it. Kai. Kai. <laughs> yes. Oh, Satan. We just watched the new Ghostbusters this week. Ooh, I haven't seen it yet. 
Oh. Very good. good. I recommend it. I thought it was good. We watched it with Kai, and the very beginning of the movie, I was like, oh, no, it's going to be scary. But then it wasn't too scary. It was actually a really great movie. Just, it was good. Cool. Yeah, it was good. It was just a good movie. And Paul Rudd has some great lines that are funny. My favorite <laughs> line, my favorite line that he says is science. He's talking about science being punk rock. And he's like, science is punk rock. It's like the nip. It's 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 the the safety pin through the nipple of academia. That's that's uh, a <laughs> you know, way to put it. You know what? It's it's just because it's and Paul Rudd. I just Rudd. laughed. It's just because it's Paul Rudd. That's no, all. it was funny. Did you go to a theater? No, no. Was it Paul Rudd? We waited for now because it's available streaming. Oh, and of course we purchased it because we are a Ghostbusters family. Yeah. So now course. we own all the Ghostbusters movies. Good. Oh, yes. Some video games. I just games. saw that. Oh, my God. <laughs> what was that? So uh, it's no, no. on the hot ones, uh, when uh, celebrities go and eat hot wings of increasing hotness, mm-hmm. um, and That's... then they're asked, like, inter- normal interview questions, kind of. The guy's a pretty good interviewer. Um, he asks un- yeah, unusual yeah. questions, I think, things that doesn't that they often don't get asked but because they're also like in distress they uh i think they answer things more truthfully sometimes than if they were in a normal interview um but paul rudd's is considered to be the best one and i just watched it recently and i guess he i will check it out he has a trick for taking photos of celebrities um that justin is showing you right now (laughs) No, what? <laughs> Those fingers? Yeah, it's supposed to look like a butt. <laughs> so, so I don't yeah. even know what's happening anymore. So I saw that trick, and then I started doing that, like, out in public, like, with my friends. Like, we're hanging out, you know, someplace, and you do, you, you do your fingers just right. You maybe even put another finger down there a little bit, and you take the picture. And it looks like you've taken a picture of somebody flashing them in public and it's just <laughs> it's just brilliant it's it is like the funny this is probably not the best one ever but it's it's still it's okay yeah yeah that's the idea it does look like a butt <laughs> yeah it does it looks like a little derriere and if you can get your mm. another finger position just right it, it looks like a little bit more than a butt Ooh, now so i want to watch in. jeff goldblum being interviewed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, always. Always. Uh, I saw the Elijah Wood one. And <laughs> he was like totally unfazed by every. He was just like, yeah, that's pretty hot. And he like had this like crazy look in his eyes. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> what Elijah is wrong with Wood this person? Insane? Like, what is happening? And I love Elijah Wood. I think he's awesome. I love like everything yeah. he's in, but it was definitely, it was like, what is what's going on with you, buddy? What's that? <laughs> what wild. is happening? It was wild. Mm. Yes. Making weird comments. Oh, hot ones. We could we could eat spicy hot wings and talk about science. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly we could. Spicy tofu wings. Yeah. Well, Paul Rudd ate cauliflower wings oh there you go wow Chicken. somebody's yeah. a big paul rudd fan you know no i paul. just saw it <laughs> okay like a few <laughs> days ago uh, because... i'm just seeing gourd's comment yes everybody's going to die whether or not an oh, yeah. ii points at you or not yeah. it'll happen eventually <laughs> well true speak for yourself <laughs> players going to live forever Yes. I'm going for the head in a jar, really. Even honestly, upload my brain to the internet. I'd go for that too. So what we need to do is rewrite the um the fame song for Blair, but make it like 
I, I have to figure it out. I have to figure it out. Something, something. We'll figure okay. it. I got to get all, all the right. science words into it. Mm -hmm. Anti-aging. Blair, Blair wants to live forever. I live forever. <laughs> she wants to learn how not to die. Blair. 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 <laughs> That's the beauty. It's one syllable. Very easy. Yeah, exactly. That'll work. <laughs> Did I watch Don't Look Up? Not yet. No. I meant to do it and I really? didn't because I still find I'm still intimidated. Yeah, it's depressing. Okay. It's a comedy. <laughs> it's not funny. My foot. A comedy my foot. There were like two no. moments that no, I thought were funny. funny. It it's was a, irreverent. It's a, it was okay. like it's a comedy <laughs> that that uh that the like you will get it is it is the Absolute. Uh, what is it? What's the, the the side gig hustle you got going over there? Was it the science talk? Uh huh. Uh huh. It is the uh -huh. reason for science talk in a nutshell is this movie. I know. That's why you have to see it, and it is funny because you will be going like, "Oh gosh, exactly. Oh, that's right." But it's not. You know, we're already living in the end times of cringeworthy things. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, there's, by the way, there is an asteroid the size of the Empire State Building that's going to do a close uh, buzz of the Earth. And you know what the uh, the, the the folks are warning about this? The cosmologists or astronomers who've seen it. You know what they're saying? Look up! Look up! Hey! Look hey up. Go. So it's you know. Let's look we, at it. It's really happening. So you know, if it, it, it rained fish. Uh, in Texas recently. As it does. As it does occasionally, anyhow. But I'm just saying. Occasionally. What? Yeah. So there's a thing called a oceanic funnel. Yep. That is. So you're talking about like, a shark NATO, is what you're talking I about. I know, like a mini shark. It was shark a fish NATO. Uh -huh. That can take place. And it drew up. Uh, it really enough. did. Yes. This was, uh, I think, sometime last it month. It happens. I don't understand the, this physics. No, it seems like it shouldn't be real, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, like, what, what kind of thing could happen now that people would be like, can you believe it? Because everybody now is pretty much like, oh, did you hear the latest new terrible, awful thing that's happening? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. But people are kind of giving up. Like people are not taking Omicron at all seriously. They've not given at all. Up, yep. really. Mm -hmm. All of humanity is mm -hmm. just like, ah, we'll just die. It's and it's fine. because it's, it's because of this same <laughs> kind of die. well, we're all gonna get it kind of mentality. That's definitely where it's coming from. I feel like is that um, because so many vaccinated people are getting it, and to them, a lot of the time, it's basically like a few days of cold symptoms now. I think that, you know, to a certain extent, people are like, well, we're all just going to get sick and then it'll be done. That's not really how it works. How it works. Also, like, if if the entire nation gets sick at the same time, we have health care problems. Our health care is ready. Our health our healthcare system is maxing out. And the problem is, like, I am hearing firsthand stories about people who are going to the hospital for other things. And then, whoops, turns out you have COVID. Now we have to put you in isolation. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean they're on ventilators. They could just have small cold symptoms or be completely asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. But the stress on the hospital system of having to put somebody in isolation completely changes the way that space operates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's to protect the person who has a lung transplant next door. And it's also to protect the the hospital workers. It's to help. It, it's to protect everybody. But it's but it makes it more complicated. Yeah. 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 How's Denmark? How are you how are you feeling about things going to the hospital? Oh yeah, uh, home. it is. A uh, it's a no choice sort of a situation, I suppose. Um, it is a situation. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, it's it, it's thankfully being taken more seriously now because it was uh, it hit very hard. The Omicron variant hit Denmark very hard, very fast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that uh, that's a little bit of a scary thing to be having a baby in the middle of mm-hmm. pandemic. It mm-hmm. raises a whole other layer of thinking about everything uh, ahead of time, let alone after the fact. You know, getting vaccinated while being mm-hmm. pregnant is scary. But then not being vaccinated while being pregnant is even, even scarier. Even scarier. <laughs> even scarier. <laughs> even right? scarier. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, due date uh, was now yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is two days ago now here. Yes. So we are in the any minute now territory. Oh, and you're now in the let's go for walks. Let's mm. eat, eat some spicy, spicy food. food. <laughs> let's do. <laughs> let's do all the things that we don't know if they really work, but they do keep me distracted while I'm waiting for the baby to come. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. Uh, So that's all, that's all I'm doing. It's just waiting for Mm -hmm. uh, Bambinini to get here. You can wait. The Bambinini will come and the, Bambinini will take over your life and uh-huh. suddenly you'll be like, what was life before I had the Bambinini? Mm-hmm. There were the before times and now mm-hmm. there's the all-encompassing time. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. I'm so excited for you. Yeah, uh, it's, it's very exciting times. But yeah, the, there is a downside of, of having to go to a hospital. Uh, yeah, and you know, if this was a if this was a second child situation, I might have pushed for being at home or something. But this is the first time, so we're going. Uh, we have booked at least uh, one night at a maternity hotel. What's that? That is a hotel that has a midwife. Uh, huh. that you can instead of staying at the hospital you have your baby and then you run to the maternity hospital and you have your own like room and it's like very hotel-y and they get some I guess room service food kind of a thing and somebody who can uh, teach you uh, how to you know uh, what end of the baby to put a diaper on and you know how to hold them and you know all that kind of stuff. How to, how to basically, because uh, it turns out they do not come with a manual. Uh, each baby is different too. And each baby is going to be very, they're, yeah. They're, they're there's no quality people. control on babies. They're mm-hmm. like all over the place. Some of them are like, I like to breastfeed. Some of them are like, no way. I like bottles. Other ones are like, ah, I don't like any of it. Yeah. So the, some of them are like, like, I'm going to sleep eight hours almost immediately. And others are like, I'm not going to sleep more than 90 minutes until I'm eight years old. So that even though, nine. even though the <laughs> hospital has a dedicated uh, maternity ward area, kind of a thing, the maternity hotel is still less populated and therefore uh, probably a little more comfortable yes yeah and you know they they have nice i mean they i'm sure they in most maternity hospital wards they're hospital rooms but they're at least you know set up for your partner to be with you and like Mm -hmm. it's not as like totally clinical i mean they're clinical but but i imagine being in a place where there are people still to help you and take care of you while you're going through that right after birth period would be awesome yeah because like the hospital kicks you out and then you're like i have to go home with this thing what (laughs) (laughs) what (laughs) i'm not ready (laughs) don't make me go Uh, i don't know what to do yeah and and then and you know it's also uh yeah i don't know i there's a part of me that still feels like we might just go yeah. We might skip the, the you book. You could. Yeah. There's a See how it goes. 
Yeah. Let's, let's just go. I mean, it's not about you. Nope. Yeah. No, it isn't. Nothing is about me. <laughs> not about no, you. Nothing is about me. <laughs> Nor will it be ever again. No. No. <laughs> it's okay. It's, yeah. I can see how, I mean, my I've had a few of my friends had babies in the pandemic and I remember them telling me that the best sleep that they got in the first year were the two nights in the hospital before they went home. <laughs> uh-huh. So that's what, the only thing I would say is like, I think that might True. be a really big plus to taking oh, your no. booking. No, no. See, here's the thing. <laughs> the, the other side of this wall, there's a uh, now maybe a six month old baby. Time to get revenge. For all. <laughs> They're, for they're the neighbors. just you know, those poor poor people they're just getting decent amounts of sleep oh, now no. they just got there and we're gonna show up with this little screaming crying baby and just be like oh no what is happening <laughs> <laughs> I <have> no idea <laughs> oh it's all it, it's all fun mm-hmm. all fair Oh my goodness. Ah. But yeah, I'll uh, 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 probably now, I don't know if I'll make next week's show or not. Yeah. I was thinking this is the one I would definitely not, you know, likely be making. Might be uh, next week. Might yeah. be here next week. I might not. Who knows? Yeah, I was two weeks out. late. Well, so when yeah. I had Kai, I was two weeks and and then they still, and then I was still induced. So Kai was like, I'm not coming out. Um, the, the he's like, numbers, his side, like, no. The numbers game uh, is that uh, first children and boys specifically tend to be the latest. Mm-hmm. That combo. So, and uh, that's your combo. Yeah, that's the combo. So, is that like sharks in the full moon or is that like real? <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> so the thing is, the thing is, uh-huh. it, it's there, but then, you know, uh, what is the number? Four uh, percent of babies are born on their due date, right? And then you've got the weeks before. Ooh, you don't even after. really know a hundred percent when you conceive. Like that's a whole thing. That and, doesn't like, matter. They think when you they conceive. know, but really it they don't. And... Well, they do. They do. They do. And it's not when you conceive, but that's that's fine. You'll find out that math later. It's it's. <laughs> It's a different math. No, it's that, no, it is a different it, math. It's part, it's yeah. part of, I know the figure goes. It goes into the figures. It's part of it. It's not all of it. I know no, it's, they it's don't about care. like they how literally they're don't care. And yeah, no, I. You're, you're you know, like, no, we think it was on a Thursday, and, not on the following Wednesday, but it was yeah. probably late at night. No, they don't care, and it has nothing to do with how they come up with the number <laughs> at all. At all. <laughs> you think it should? I can see your face. You're like. But that no, that's, really just, that's not the experience doesn't my friends come up. had. Doesn't come up. <laughs> <laughs> but I am surprised because I, uh, I feel like we have been like a week ahead of all the what to expect symptoms the whole mm-hmm. time. We're, we've always been like, oh, yeah, that was, uh, you know, we're already there. Yep. So I kept thinking we might be ahead of the, you know. They're saying, there, there's no more room. <laughs> there is no more you're, room. You're already a week late. Just, you're a week late. I could be. We just, it's, you know, <laughs> you just don't know. But, uh, yeah. Any day now. Any day. And then I'll text you. I'll send some you pictures. Better. You better. Maybe, maybe you'll send me a calendar. Oh, yeah, I would like to send you a calendar. I don't have your address in Denmark. I'll send it again. I do have it. No, I don't. I don't know where. I do not have it have it in Denmark. I have not mailed you anything in Denmark. Okay. Okay. Um, Others, uh, I I will, yeah, I have to do a big mailing of calendars. So if you send me that address, I'll mail you a calendar in Denmark. All right. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Other, other than that, everything's dark and cold. <laughs> it's winter. Denmark. winter. <laughs> it's Denmark in the winter. Who, who knew? Today it was lovely. It was 
50 degrees and sunny in Portland. It's beautiful. Nice. Lovely day. Lovely day. Lovely day. All right. Should we head out? Yeah. Blair to bed. Justin on to his day. Me to a good book. Yes. Book. What are you reading? I am reading a fantasy series that I'm enjoying a lot. Okay, say no more. Yeah. No you don't more. want a fantasy series? Well, I'm actually. Well, it let depends me on the kind of book, I guess. If you were, I married. have. Uh, it's a series. Let's see. It's a series. I don't know how to. How do you pronounce it's? Uh, Irish or Gaelic as Shannon, S E A N A N, Shannon, Shane McGuire. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, she's got a series about a female fairy heroine named October Day, who she's a hero, she's a heroine and she goes and solves mysteries and nice. she's a she does blood magic, so she's con constantly like cutting herself with <laughs> cutting herself with knives to do blood magic. No science involved whatsoever. Um, but I am al also reading a book called Exercised by Daniel Le David Lieberman, Daniel Lieberman, who we might be interviewing maybe. Hmm. And then there's Wait, another isn't he book. running for some office in Arizona? Not <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the same last name. Yeah. Hmm. And then there's a book called, <clears throat> excuse me, Partial Truths by James Zimring, which is how fractions distort our thinking. Partial hmm. Truths. So it's a math logic book that I'm trying. So I've got fantasy. I've got fact. I've got all sorts of things going on right now. Book, books, 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 books. Oh, Gordon Ocean. How do you pronounce that? Shannon, Shannon McGuire. Yes. I mean, it's obviously William. That's how you say it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> obviously. Obviously, the way Obviously. Irish pronunciation works. That's my guess. Yeah, that's yeah. I, it's just not even worth trying. It could be Sarah. Like, yeah, it's right? not. <laughs> No, it's just, yeah, it's, they have, they, they're, using the, they're using the English language to an extent, and then we're like, ah, yeah, but we know what that really is. I, yeah, I don't know how Shannon, I know, I I think it's Shannon, but I have no idea. Shannon, I have no clue. I'm just not even, I should, can't even try anymore. I mean, these books are fun. They're like candy. You know, they're like the, you, you know, it's like, oh, it's yummy. And I love it. It's a good mental break. Nothing's mm. real. It takes place in San Francisco. So it's super fun because I know the whole topography and the places that they're visiting and everything. But the whole front of the book is like a list of pronunciations for the names of different fairies and different fae that are in the book. And I just laugh at that because I, I don't know how to pronounce these things. No clue. <sighs> but anyway, books. What are you reading, Justin? Uh, I am reading the uh, the the final. I'm, I'm reading Blair's face right now. <laughs> Blair's face says good night. <laughs> good night. Say no, good night, you Blair. didn't finish. What are you reading right now? I'm not re I'm reading anything right now. I'm about to be reading. I have I'm uh, have classes coming up uh, uh, starting uh, next week. Okay. Uh, the uh, text, the dreaded textbook. I've got textbooks to read. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Mm. I've got some uh, critical language interpretation thingy, uh, literature thing. I've got uh, something about ancient civilization class. Just learn about Great. origins of or something should be interesting to find out sounds perfect for you about that stuff. and then math i'm going to be reading math class math what kind of math it's the math, annoying math? kind with the lying fractions and the lying <laughs> fractions 
<laughs> That's the booklet. <laughs> That's what Sue's talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a throwback. That was a throwback. Yes, yeah, it was a, sorry, I'm, my brain's deteriorating. Whole, you know what? I, that's what I was really reading <laughs> initially was the deterioration. Yeah. Deteri now I can't talk because I'm starting to deteriorate too. Say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. I'm gonna go read Hocus Pocus by Gert Vonnegut. Oh, that's a good um, one. Um, good night, Justin. Good night, Blair. Good night. I don't remember how this works. Good night, Kiki. <laughs> good night, oh, no. Dr. Kiki. <laughs> good well night, done. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will be back again next week. It's been a lovely night, morning, whatever time of day it is for where you are. So sciencey for us all. Stay safe, stay well, stay happy and healthy and whole. And we hope we'll see you next week.